today on Doomed. If you are listening to this show live right now on July 22nd, 2021, then tomorrow is the opening ceremony of the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo. And on today's episode of Doomed with Matt Binder, we will be talking about why they should be abolished. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, we're getting into the problematic history of the Olympic Games, what the games do to its host countries, this year's Tokyo Games, and the growing No Olympics LA movement. And joining me to discuss all of this, one second, let me pull us up on the screen here, is my guest for this episode, Gia Lappi. She is an organizer with No Olympics LA, and she wrote, co-wrote, I should say, a great piece for the Jacobin called Abolish the Olympics. Uh, great to have you on the show tonight. Oh, well, thank you for having me and the Olympics. It's, it's, I, I just want to say that uh, this piece that you, uh, you wrote for Jacobin, I was telling you before we started, there is so much in this. It is really a fantastic piece. Everyone should read it. It's linked on the Patreon page and in the description of the YouTube uh, uh, live stream. Uh, th there's so much in it. I, we won't be able to get to everything in this episode, but okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd, you'd be here for, you would literally do like a whole podcast just on this, like, and never, Oh, there is a podcast. There is a podcast. So, yeah, there is. There's a podcast. Um, and then we sort of updated it and we've been doing a radio show. So where can people I'll check that out? Link to that. Yeah, uh, we've got a SoundCloud. Um, I think it's at No Olympics LA on SoundCloud, and we've reposted the episodes there. Now, Gia, let's start. Mm -hmm. I guess at the very beginning, right? The Please. the beginning of the Olympics. It's always, you know, I think, and you mentioned this in your piece, you know. People think of oh, uh, the Olympic Games, the history of it, and they think of like. You know the ancient Greeks and the Olympics, and and it's sort of like, all right, let's go back and see all this, and and you really can't because the modern day Olympics doesn't really have any. I mean, sure, the first Olympic Games of the even the, you know the modern day Olympic Games in the late 1800s, first one was in Greece, but other than that, there's really like it. It seems like it's all just for for marketing or PR purposes. Yeah, and we mentioned that in the article. There was there was a sentence that I was having trouble with because it like that idea of the games, like being, you know, going back to ancient Greece, like the modern day games going back to ancient Greece to me feels like a very complicated thing in that, like it is both used for marketing. Like there's this funny ad like by got milk or like, you know, big milk, um, talking about how milk is like the original sports drink um, and in that way using or like kind of like normalizing or like the the kind of ancient like ancient athlete as this sort of you know figure and that like how that can be used for marketing and then also like I think a big thing there is also sort of normalizing how long or trying to normalize like how long the Olympics have been around and how that can really make the abolishments um, like a, a less like easy idea to grapple with. You know, if we think right. these are games that have been around since, you know, like whatever, like 700 BC, um, it becomes a lot harder to believe that they can be like that they don't have to exist. Right, but right. That's really that. Exist. That's a really great point because you know if you think about it, with the with the first, there was only one game in the late 1800s. That's how late it it started. Is the first the uh, first in Greece, 
And then, of course, it happens every four years, the Summer Olympics. Surprise, surprise, there's no real history. I mean, sure, the Winter Olympics comes along in like the early 1900s. I think it's like, what, 19... Uh, the 1910s or 20s. But, I mean, it's not like it has ties to ancient Greece because they weren't playing in the snow in ancient Greece. Uh, so, yeah, that's a great point. It really, every four years, how many Olympic Games have ever been? Not that many. It's not It's not some long history thing that dates back to 700 BC, like you said. No, no, there, it, it's not. And it was started by, you know, the modern day games were started by this, like, what my comrade uh, who I wrote the piece with called like the proto proud boy, uh, Pierre de Coubertin, um, who really started the games as a way of like basically hyping up like France and like really getting, it was really just like a nationalistic em- enterprise. Right, right. Um, Pierre de Coubert, I don't, I don't really, I have to look into him. He was a, um, eugen- a eugenicist. Jeez. Yeah. All right. Like, yeah, a lot of really nasty quotes. And the Olympics still tweets about him as if he's like, you know, a a, a figure they're proud of. So that I think speaks a lot to where they're at. So wouldn't would wouldn't his like like his name sort of give up the 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 like give up the whole charade though that this is back in you know ancient greece 700 bc like weren't many pierres running around then. right <laughs> you, you think they would realize this doesn't all add up but i guess it doesn't really matter um so what because nothing they do i don't think they think there are any consequence they don't think about anything they do beyond you know the moment they're doing it right right other than you know the whole speculative real estate game right and we'll get into that in a second. Before we move on from like uh, historic Olympic games, I, I want to get to this because I did not know about this. Uh, this was, uh, I mean, I don't want to say shocking because it's not a surprise, I guess, but it's still jarring to read about and see. And that is the uh, 1904 games in St. Louis where they had an event called Anthropology Days. Can you tell us about that? Um. Yeah, I mean, it's even worse than it sounds. It was, those games were really used. I mean, Pierre de Coubertin in general used sport as a way to sort of, in in his mind, like civilize people. And so, like, think of, like, the worst thing a sideshow could be. And that's what, he did in, you know, in these games and in, in those games in particular. Um, yeah. So was it, was it like a, cause I, I'm reading what, what you wrote in the piece about, it, and it's basically uh, indigenous people were brought in to compete against, uh, you know, the Westerners and they would basically have to play games and, and play up the whole idea that they're quote unquote savages. It, it seems like, I, I think sideshow was a great word for it. Yeah. Um, and I don't think this, this made it into the piece, but like one can argue that the Olympics are still just as racist and um, like dangerous and like in, in their own way, like, or like are very clearly still a sideshow for you know, whatever weird kind of ideals they they're still perpetuating. Right. And and when people think about the Olympic torch, they probably don't think about Nazi Germany, but they should. Can can you tell us a little bit about that? If you want to talk about it for one second. Oh yeah, don't worry about it. I totally know all about needing drinks and stuff like that. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. I have low blood sugar. I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah. Um, the yeah people tend to think that the torch, like so many of like so many kind of like icons, the game you just now goes back a lot farther. But 
the 1936 games are also known as the Nazi Olympics and the torch um, was part of those games in Berlin. Right, right. And recently, didn't the Olympic Games share something? Or, or I guess they, they don't really try to hide this part of their history, which I guess it's good they don't hide it, but they certainly shouldn't be, you know, it should be, if anything, I guess, a, a moment to reflect, yet they seem to be promoting it as just another Olympic Games when they bring up the, the games that happened in Nazi Germany that basically were used by Hitler and uh, his regime to, to as a propaganda tool. Yeah. Um, am I frozen? Yeah, you just froze. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, honestly, that works to my benefit in a way so I can keep eating. Um, yeah. Um, the. Oh, am I totally gone? Yeah, I took. Uh, we could fix the. Uh, I could call you oh. back on Skype if you want, but why don't we just go ahead with this and then I, we'll reset in a second. Yeah. Um, yeah, those, yeah, they tweeted about those games last year, like completely shamelessly without any kind of acknowledgement of the history of the games. And um, the Holocaust Memorial um, tweeted back and, and basically called them out for it. And they didn't go so far as to acknowledge or apologize the history of those games. They deleted the tweet, but without any any acknowledgement or apology right. about it. Right. So let me let me actually uh let before we go into uh the Tokyo games, do you want me to uh can I just call I'll hang up this call and I'll call you right back so we can see if that fixes the video. Or would you rather not have the uh video? It's up to you. No, no you can call me back. All right, cool. Let me call you back. Okay. One second, ladies and gentlemen. Let's just fix this small Skype issue. Boop, boop, boop. Skype ring is going on. There we go. You're back. And oh. there you are. Great. Okay, great. So let's now talk about... I mean, there's a lot of history, actually. We could continue on. But let's talk about uh, what... In general, and this this also talks about you know the games going back to the beginning, but it also brings the modern games, uh, the current games coming up in Tokyo, and also future games. What does the Olympics do to the host cities? Because I feel like most people, when they think of the Olympics and it's coming to your city, they recall how you know their their elected officials and all their local businesses probably or real estate development especially uh working hard to promote the idea that they should be the host city cities run entire marketing campaigns just try to try to show the ioc uh that their city is the best city to host whatever olympic games they're competing for tell us a little bit about that okay that's a big question but i'm gonna answer it hopefully step by step and get to all of it. Um, one, one, I think pro or something to be excited about is that fewer and fewer cities are kind of running those campaigns. People I think are starting to get more like are starting to see like how detrimental, you know, hosting the games is for a city and whether it be for the same reasons that we, you know, post the games or for like budgetary reasons, which is like not, our bottom line or like of really interest to us. Um, like people are like resisting and fewer and fewer cities are even like making that bid or making that effort. Um, and that's a big reason why LA was awarded when it was like, you know, LA was awarded at the same time as Paris, which got 2024 LA was in the running for 2024 and was awarded 2028. Um, and that's essentially because nobody else wanted to host it then. Um, <laughs> so in that way, like, yeah, we have something, I think that like, I'm, I'm like, that feels like a big, not win, but you know, it feels like things are 
looking up in that way. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember growing up like the, I think it was like even like Chicago, not that long ago, like it being a really big deal. I remember like the Obamas like campaigning for Chicago to get the Olympics and that wasn't, you know, I, I, I think especially as a child, like you're, you're only getting these impressions of what something is. And like these marketing campaigns are a huge sort of way that people become, I think like sort of subsumed and like in the kind of fake nostalgic promise of what the Olympics bring and, and stop really asking questions. Um, the, what, right now, now the big thing is like, what do, what do the Olympics do to their host cities or to the host cities? Um, I think the primary way of like looking at it is that like the Olympics don't bring any new problems to the cities. They just exacerbate ones that are already in existence. And so, you know, police just like more, po like the Olympics bring more police. The Olympics bring like with that, like the national special security event situation, which is one, side note but to the city um yeah they essentially are like breeding grounds for or like reasons for gentrification which you know also means police but means displacement means like social cleansing um yeah. Right, right. And, you know, I feel like the, uh, an issue that does come with the Olympics that wasn't already there, although I'm sure uh, in some areas it probably would come eventually, um, displacement of people who live in the areas where the Olympics wants to decides to build its various different stadiums. Like, it, it always was baffling to me. It never really made any sense why every four years these giant multiple giant stadium like not giant stadium but giant stadiums uh you know spring up in these cities that are hosting the olympics and it's always like you know the 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 marketing and the advertising and the pr going into this is always oh look a new modern track and field uh stadium for this city oh look a new this will become a sports complex after the olympics and i feel like almost every time the olympics comes they use these facilities they go and then these arenas and stadiums just become dilapidated no one uses them they just sit there because there aren't that many whatever that game is like people to play that game in that city you know it seems like just bizarre to me that the, these giant buildings just take up all this space in these major hubs every four years just to sit there and rot away. It's, it's so bizarre. Yeah. It's bizarre and it's tragic and super violent. Um, when you think of like Pyeongchang and like a sacred ancient forest being completely destroyed to make like way for a ski mountain for the winter Olympics. Uh, that ended up being used like twice and now just sits there completely abandoned. I mean, and, and, and you can go like on the internet and basically see in, mo in every host city completely abandoned stadiums where nothing exists except like rot at this point. Um, and, and there's and another example that I like can bring up is not only like I, things can be abandoned entirely, particularly like these huge, um, like sometimes billion dollar builds, but sometimes they can also be privatized. Like when you think of like, like the 84 games, which happened in LA, um, the, the pool that was built for those games ended up becoming like part of USC's like campus. And so what was promised to be like a pool for the community ended up going to a multi-billion dollar institution. Right, right. And it's students, yeah. Wow. 
So, you know, I think like, you know, we're talking about all of the stadiums that go up every four, well, every two years, even crazier, actually, if you think about the Winter Olympics, these specific, like, like, you know, this, you know, a lot of people swim. So, you know, you could use a pool in any city. And unfortunately, in the scenarios, it seems like it's not going to the public. But the idea of a public pool uh, facility, a uh, high class, you know, up, uh, you know, a uh, uh, you know, nice public pool facility uh, is it seems sounds like a good idea but like when it comes to the winter olympics like how many people are going to be using these like skiing resorts and stuff like that like it seems even more specific yeah i mean i'd argue that it's equally illogical no matter what because nobody's using them anyway right, right. um but the olympic the winter olympics are Hilarious to think about, no, them. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's no sound logic for the Summer Olympics. And so there is equally no sound logic for like the construction and destruction that happens for the Winter Olympics. Right. Now, now it, it seems like, and you mentioned this in your piece, that, you know, if you're someone who enjoys the Olympic Games, but uh, has an issue with all of these uh, things that happen to all these host cities and the people who are victimized uh, by the Olympics coming to their city. Uh, an idea would be to just pick a single location that the Olympics is held every single four, well, every single time there's an Olympic Games. Just one location, everything happens there. But, you know, you go into this in the piece that that would take away uh, a number of things that really is the purpose of the Olympics. And that is this real estate development, the money that goes into these bidding wars. I mean, I mean, do you think that would ever be a thing that the Olympics even look at, or it's just, that's just not what they're about. I mean, the Olympics and really like the IOC has no interest in sports or in athletes. And so I can't imagine a situation or a scenario where that happens because without the, speculative real estate game part of the Olympics and without that sort of source of like capital, the, the, the IOC has nothing to stand on. Right. Now let's get into, cause you know, again, there's another argument there for people who enjoy the Olympics. Oh, but, and you just, you know, you just, you know, mentioned that, you know, the IOC doesn't really care about the athletes and maybe someone would say, you know, no, look at the Olympic Games, the people that all, all over the world, you know, athletes work hard to have dreams when they're children to be working, to be uh, competing, excuse me, in the Olympic Games. And they're living out their dreams. And it's, you know, nice to see the world come together for competition. But I mean, if anything showed that the IOC doesn't actually care about the athletes, uh, I think this year's game uh, games are are the perfect embodiment of it, because while we're talking about all these issues that plague every Olympics that there's been, this year seems to have its own uh, very unique set of uh, problems, which is the COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, you know, we're seeing athletes show up. And immediately being, uh, you know, taking the flight to uh, to uh, Japan and immediately being told pretty much after taking a test that, hey, you uh, flew out here for no reason. You can't compete. You're you're you've tested positive. Yeah, I mean. And I and I feel, you know, obviously very sorry to those athletes, but beyond the kind of like detriment there is like all of like what that what that what bringing in you know potentially unvaccinated athletes or athletes you know who have been infected and there have been a number of athletes who've tested positive um it, like what that's doing and like like how that's endangering like also the citizens in japan right. is exponentially like worse and more devastating but yeah i mean i think the olympics have created an environment and like a a narrative where 
they're the only opportunity for an athlete. And like, they really exist because they've sort of created a world where they've defined success and they've also like created that scarcity and um, yeah. And so I think to, to close off, they've, they've, they've really don't allow athletes opportunities to do anything else. Um, yeah. Right. No, no, do they, are you saying that they, um, they, they, can you expand on that a little bit? What, how do they, um, you know, they, they obviously have to force the athletes into specific, um, you know, to, to, uh, agree to specific terms and such like that. But are you saying that there's certain sports where basically, I mean, uh, this is how I'm interpreting it. There are certain sports where basically, I mean, you, you watch just during the Olympics, there is no real, uh, industry surrounding, you know, like there's basketball in the summer Olympics, but you know, basketball has a whole industry around it, but then there's like lesser known sports like i don't know discus throwing and things like that which obviously people work hard on that though that but there isn't like a whole industry like the nba or mlb or nfl or fifa that surrounds you know these smaller sports where pretty much the olympics is their only uh shot at, at doing accomplishing anything in their in their sport of choice yeah that's something that uh jules boykoff who wrote power games um, and also no Olympians and is uh, plug speaking at an event at stories in echo park in Los Angeles tomorrow, um, along with a number of organizers and, um, tenants and, um, members of an organization called attack, which is unhoused tenants, um, union, uh, yeah, and they'll all be speaking at stories tomorrow. And I recommend anyone in LA go because uh, go, they'll be a lot more eloquent than I am right now, honestly. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, but Jules talks about this like I, like idea that like there are no, you know, there is no like ESPN like feature for these very specific, you know, or like niche games. And so the Olympics are really their only opportunity for any kind of if you even want like, like glory or competition or recognition. And like, these are people who've dedicated their entire lives in a lot of cases to this one sport. Um, and most everything rests on this one, you know, game every four years. And so like, what other option do they have other than going to say Tokyo and like being at risk in that way? Right. I mean, they have the option to say no. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah they, they, it makes it incredibly difficult. Right. I mean, there's been a lot of, it seems like there's been a lot of issues with, with the athletes, but let's move on actually to, to, like you mentioned, it's the more, you know, obviously important uh, uh, issue at hand here. And that's the people of uh, the host city, Tokyo. Uh, I was reading, um, I, I've seen, I think it's even mentioned in your piece that there was a poll that showed that something like 80 some odd percent of citizens of Tokyo, Japan did not want the Olympics to happen. Uh, I, I, that's, that's since COVID, right? Like they wanted it to be canceled due to the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I think that poll, I think was done in May, if I remember correctly. Um, 86% of citizens did not want the Olympics and they came anyway and they're there right now. And it's, the IOC really has like complete like impunity. And even if the very corrupt Japanese government said they didn't want the Olympics happening, they did not. But if, if they had, the Olympics could go on anyway. Cause after a certain point, it really is like you've signed the soul of your city or, you know, like any kind of freedom or away, like away when you decide to host the Olympics and, something that we've been doing at an Olympics is trying to get the host city contract um, from someone in local government, but it seems like that has not actually been written or no matter what sort of requests we've put in, it doesn't seem to exist. And so we have no idea what exactly 
we've signed over. Like, I don't know if the city council that voted to approve it because we don't get a say, the citizens never get a say from the get, um, doesn't know what they've signed over to the IOC yet. Wow. Wow. And, and you know, not, I, I, we'll talk about the, the upcoming Olympics in LA in, in just a second. I just wanted to stick with Tokyo for just another couple of minutes. Um, what, what's stunning to me is that, you know, in your piece, you break this down too. Uh, the Olympics, uh, this year's Olympics was basically the right wing government in Japan's way of trying to revive the country in the wake of uh, Fukushima, the, uh, the nuclear explosion. And, you know, this was what, back in 2013. Uh, oh, the, the 2013 was, uh, this was when yeah, they were right. awarded the, uh, the, right. the Olympics. Right, right. And, you know, you, you mentioned that, uh, obviously this, they're not even, you know, recovered from that actual, uh, explosion yet, let alone, you know, thinking about doing the Olympics and on top of that, this pandemic. And then, you know, you go through a, a seriously like a list of different things that have gone wrong here from various members, like high uh, executives, I guess you can call them in the Olympic committee being forced to resign or for, for various different reasons for, uh, seems like there was uh, sexual abuse charges and, and misogyny claims and just, you know, disaster all around. And then it just, you know, I, I just think about how, you know, they're still calling it the 2020 Olympics too. And if anything, like, could explain why they're doing that. I mean, it seems pretty obvious. All the merchandise is printed up already. Like, and they're as big of a disaster as like everyone remembers last year to be. Um, yeah, that's that's funny. It, it definitely it's a of course like everything else with the Olympics and the IOC, it's it's a branding thing. Right. Like, why wouldn't you just you know it's not 2020 anymore. It's 2021. Uh, you think you would call it the 2021 games, even though they live was... in their own reality. Right, right. Like it's... the IOC just thinks that they can write whatever story, like, and people will somehow buy it. Right. And I think fewer and fewer, I think these games in particular, it's like truly who wants the games? Like, it's not uh, like, I don't think it's a fringe idea that the, this whole thing is absolutely absurd. And yet they, march on and they yeah um another well, another thing that i didn't point out about both like i think this is like an athlete thing and just like a tokyo um and fukushima in particular environment thing one like the like fukushima is still not livable like the like it's still toxic to live there and yet they have they're hosting the games there and beyond that i'm not I have not been to Tokyo in the summer yet, but I think anybody who has will tell you that it's probably the hottest place they've ever been. Um, there were there were a big group of No Olympics members went to Tokyo two years ago, and I think despite like how exciting it probably was or would have been to be in Tokyo, nobody wanted to do anything because it was so fucking humid. Oh, right. Like, right. Like triple digits, but like air being thick. And that's where the athletes are expected to compete right now. Right. Not to go into a whole nother sporting event. Cause again, this is its own, it could be its own a whole entire podcast, but this is something quite similar with FIFA's uh, genius decision to have uh, one of the upcoming world cups in Qatar. It's like, yeah. are you kidding? Yeah. It's something that. Yeah, it's, I mean, not. Yeah. It's like, wow. Like, they even had to. They, they actually moved the. Uh, the Like, the uh, like the Olympics usually happens. I th oh, Not the Olympics, excuse me. The World Cup usually happens, what, in like the summer, right? July or August. And they had to move it to like a totally different season for that specific World Cup because of how ridiculously hot it's going to be. Um, there's. there's Yeah, I mean, I, I, the whole thing should should raise questions about why why these organizations or sports organizations choose city like choose the cities they choose right right now uh, before we move on i just want to quickly mention i saw this insane story about this this uh this man in tokyo who was previously displaced by 
uh, the games uh, before this one. I forget what year that was. Was this the 80s, the 90s, 70s? I can't remember. A number of decades oh. back. The, oh, yeah, the 70s. 70s, right. And he w- And at the time, he said, like, you know, I he was being under, which is uh, kudos to that guy, I guess – you know, the culture there is, is more understanding. But uh, he was like, oh, I'm, you know, proud. I was proud to have had to do this for the country so they could have these games. And now he's an old man. And he was displaced for the second time by the Olympics this year's games. Like the same guy displaced by the Olympics twice in his own city. And this time around, I guess he's just had it, especially at the age he's at. And he's just like... This is ridiculous. I can't believe this happened to me again. And, you know, I just wanted to mention that because it's just, you know, the I, it's just ridiculous. Like it's just so unbelievable that people are expected to just get up and move for an event that literally takes uh, up two weeks. Like what the competitions or two, maybe maybe a little bit longer than that because some games happen before the official opening ceremony, which I don't even. But uh, yeah, it's 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 so crazy. So let's let's. I- Yeah, no, I think just like the first games that I really kind of began to understand, like, you know, way back before I was, you know, a part of No Olympics LA um, were were, were like the games in Rio and like the, you know, the destruction of the favelas. But I think it's really, and I think most people tend to associate like the violence of the Olympics and like the disaster of the Olympics with those games um, and with like, that displacement but i think it's important for people to also know like there have been over two million people who've been displaced by the games in the last 20 years um so that doesn't even include that first displacement in tokyo wow and someone in the uh, youtube chat dub c says the 76 olympics put montreal in debt for like three decades that's you know that's another thing too that i I, you, I mean, I guess, like you said, they're catching on. It's starting to catch on with cities, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But, like, the whole idea of the Olympics coming and being some sort of business boom, too, again, for an event that lasts a total of two weeks, and addendum for this year's, there won't even be that supposed tourist boom because people aren't even allowed to go to the Olympics this year uh, to spectate uh, because of COVID. Um, but like, it doesn't seem like that ever really works out. It just seems like the city puts the city, the city, the host cities give way more, way, 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 way more to the IOC than the IOC gives in return. Oh yeah. And it's never beneficial for small businesses. It never has been. That's a myth. And like, if you think like in 84, like the small business owners, um, particularly like black small business owners ended up suing the city because of like the broken promises that it had made these kind of mom and pop shops about what the Olympics would do. Um, the, um, yeah, as far as like tourism goes, like no, like Tokyo doesn't need more tourism. LA does not need more tourism. Like there, it's sort of oversaturated as it is. Um, like, that's really a great. I'm sorry. That's interrupt. That's really a great point because you think if that was the whole appeal, like why wouldn't they uh, go to a you know like a, a city in an area that's not very developed where they could be the development, not a place that's already overflowing with tourism and you know uh, densely populated. Like you never hear them going to like. Some, they go to an underrated city. Right. Right, a place where there's wide no, open. No, no, don't go anywhere. Right, do right, not. Right, go right. But I think you know. You think though, if that was the argument, though, they would be going to like you know somewhere in Montana or something like that, you know. But they just they don't. Yeah, go to Yellowstone with all the billionaires. Like take them out. <laughs> now let's. Oh, before we go to we get to your your organization, No Olympics LA. I want to make one more point when we talk about people, the, the people and organizations who benefit. I think we would be uh, remiss to not specifically mention uh, NBC. Um, They push these Olympics, and I'm sure they spend a ton of money to be the sole, at least in the United States, the sole broadcaster of all the Olympic games to the point where they like set up live streams for the games that aren't even on TV. It's just like a 24-7 Olympics live stream for two weeks. 
along with all the other television programming they do uh, preempt on TV to air the Olympic Games. I, I, oh, it always baffles me because, yes, there are people who enjoy the Olympics, but it really does seem like a very niche uh, thing. Yet they act, they really do act like it's some big event that the whole country sits down and watches. And it's just like, again, maybe there's certain matches, you know, obviously I'm sure it was the, like, you know, the, the miracle on ice, I'm sure was something people all sat around and watched like specific events. But the idea that they're the entire country, like is like, can't wait to watch, uh, you know, a random track and field event or something like that. I mean, it's so bizarre how much they push it like that. Yeah, no, they, they, they completely write their own reality and in some ways have enough money to kind of perpetuate the idea that it, it's real. And yeah, they, I think they, they, they've almost, they're trying to convince people that like they're excited about the Olympics. Right. And I don't think that many people would miss them if they were gone. Right. I mean, I'm sure people have been noticed last year, to be honest. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we, we, we did have a year where it was gone and it was, it was none. Um, yeah. and, 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 one and that's when people were staying home and doing very little, hopefully anyway. Right. And even then, I don't, I don't think more than a handful of people was thinking, Hey, I wish the Olympics was on right now. Right. I mean, we, we do go without an Olympics for two years, you know, like there's a gap, mm -hmm. like people are people, we, we live, we, we live, don't we? Uh, now let's, let's talk about no Olympics LA. Now this is for what it's the 2028 Olympics, right? Yes. And what is your organization um, doing? I mean, obviously the, the host, you already are going to be the host city. Um, but this is now seven years out. So what what is already going on though there? Like, are there already, I know you mentioned a little bit early on that you, you, your group tried to look into, uh, some of the details that, you know, the, the city signed and there's nothing coming up. Is, is there anything even happening quite yet? Like you guys are obviously smart for getting ahead of it. So, so early, but is there anything specifically going on that's already affecting the city in terms of the Olympics coming in, in, in 2028? Yes, there absolutely is. Um, yeah, the, the bid here was awarded actually in 2017. So that's 11 years wow. ahead of the games. Um, and since then, and like even before, um, the city has been criminalizing houselessness um, like there is, there's one thing in particular that I think is always to me, like when I, when I learned about this, uh, like blew my mind there, you know, LA has like decent laws, uh, like on rent controlled buildings that, you know, were basically buildings built in before a certain year. Um, and there's a way around that like ordinance, which is called the Ellis Act, that essentially like a, like a landlord cannot like forcibly like all of these things in quotes, cause like they do so many things that illegally, but um, like displace you unless, or, and like clear out a building, unless that building or that, that piece of land or property is gonna be used to build a hotel. So like the incentives to build hotels in the city are so like obviously like in the like in favor of landowners and landlords and um that of course like feels like a direct sort of not even response but like a, a justification for the games and for development and for displacing people around the city even now and people a, a bunch of people have been displayed uh, displaced because of that um i'm not sure like what your viewership is or if you talked about like uh what happened in echo park back in march but uh there were close to 200 people or like who like like in covid um lived in Echo Park and had a really incredible community there. Um, 
called Echo Park Rise Up, and um, they were sort of semi-protected because of COVID regulations and were allowed to build that community out. And to whatever degree, you know, this was really followed, um, like had some protections against police um, and, you know, being forcibly removed. And then there was Mitch O'Farrell, who's their council person, um, decided that he was going to renovate the park back in March and like in less than a week after like making that announcement, um, people started getting forcibly removed from the park and a community that had its own garden, they had built their own showers, had their own kitchen. Um, and this was like with zero help from the city, which had shut off that, like that side of the park's bathrooms was not like providing running water, like w would shut off the lights at night. Um, so completely attempted to, or, and then did displace that entire community. And if I'm not, again, I'm not sure, like if you looked at the footage there or like what, what, cause it's, sometimes it's like, I'll talk to people and they have no idea that any of this happened. And it just like blows my mind because for like three days, Echo Park Lake, um, and, and like the surrounding area was a, it looked like a war zone Jeez. and, um, it was like, you know, like hundreds of people were arrested journalists had their bones broken um like there were like riot police everywhere um yeah it was it was something that like you almost like have to look at pictures to really understand and this was because people were trying to protect themselves and protect their neighbors from getting forcibly removed and like put into carceral housing if they so chose wow. housing, which was promised them. Wow. Now, what what are they gonna like? I'm trying to think. Like again, Los Angeles, like we were mentioning before, was a huge city. Plenty of people live there. Where are they even gonna build these? Like, it's just I, I don't get it. Like, and also, what, the LA had a they hosted the Olympics before, didn't they? I mean, like what in the 80s? I think. Yeah, 84. And then 32. 32. Gee, so this is the third time. Well, but let, let's stick with, you know, because 32 is obviously pretty far back. But 84 is not so far back to the terms of, like, those buildings are probably still there, no? Like, do you, what what became of the 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 uh, infrastructure for the Olympics when they came to L.A. in 1984? That, I think we, we could have sort of a, we could see what's going to happen based on that, essentially, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that like, the Coliseum, well, that, that was actually for the other games. But, um, yeah, I mean, like, I mentioned, like, the example of the pool. This Olympics, I think, like, the Olympics in 84, their whole kind of, like, selling point or, like, their, they were, you know, in scare quotes, like, the first profitable Olympics. And, like, the money that was left over from those games was used to start – like the LA 84 foundation, which is essentially like a real estate fund, like nonprofit, like nonprofit again, in scare quotes, you know, right. that is selling the idea of like youth sports um, as a justification for even the games now. And is really just like a real estate investment company or, you know, ha has millions of dollars invested in Blackstone and very little in youth sports. Um, yeah, so that the games, the '84 games, are really sold as like the game, the profitable games, like the first like capitalist games, um, and these games now are 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 kind of like riding on the idea of being like a no build Olympics. So technically, using already existing facilities, but um, SoFi Stadium, which is in Inglewood, was built coincidentally like and announced right around the time that the Olympics were right. and just finished, you know, after killing a few construction workers in, you know, the process and being like, and continuing construction through all of COVID because it was essential to open for no one. Um, 
Yeah, it, it was built in Inglewood, which is a predominantly black and brown community um, or neighborhood or actually city because, it, yeah, it's, it's actually its own city. But uh, SoFi is now like his, like the world's most expensive stadium. It was built by the same people who um, built the stadium in Tokyo, but really... Um, yeah, and so like LA is being sold as a like no build Olympics, but it's also really resting on something like the like SoFi Stadium. And now Steve Ballmer, who owns the Clippers, is building um, a stadium right next to SoFi and displacing you know many people in the process. Wow, but uh, that yeah. That... Um, yeah. No, that thing that you just said where like you know they just they try it's it sounds like they are starting to uh, and and we've basically started off with you saying this at the very top of the uh, our discussion. It does seem like they are becoming more aware of of the perception. I don't think they. I, I'm sure you agree that they actually care. It's just that they realize that the perception of these things is starting to. I mean, they're caring about the perception because the reality of the situation is starting to catch up with them. Um, and, and we could we could uh, leave it with this, and how you mention in uh, your piece for the Jacobin that uh, the latest location for the games is the 2032 Olympic Games in Australia. And why why is that a unique uh, announcement they're about to make? You mentioned in your piece. I want but I want you to uh to you know sort of cap it off here. Why oh, like, Australia? You know, the, the the 2032 games in general because you mentioned how there's this, this Olympics is just going to be announced uh, the host city will be announced, and there was no, no. They just announced it. Yeah, and and there was no um, bidding war, like they just. Oh. Yeah, essentially, I mean, and and there was no real like pomp and circumstance as far as like the, the 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 process goes because, well, for one the city doesn't, or like the, you know, the citizens don't have a say anyway. And so they really, it really felt like an under the table deal and there, everyone else pulled out. I don't know if that's what you're yeah, getting at. No, you're right. But. Right. Cause you know, that's, I mean, to me that shows exactly what's going on in terms of like, what are they going to do next? Like, what are they going to do after the 2032 games? It's becoming clear that right. like there's, right. there's no cities that want this anymore. Like mm -hmm. when, when you have a, you know, when you are used to these big bidding wars and all these cities competing for your event. And then all of a sudden uh, the next one that you need to schedule uh, only one city wants to, a part of it. Once you have that event in that city, what's next? You know, like what, what happens yeah. from there? LA, LA and Paris were the only two left and now it's down to one. And I honestly cannot tell you what is going to happen, but I, it really does feel like the IOC is crashing and burning and doesn't really know how to figure it out. They're again, like so delusional that they might do it to themselves. We might not have to. <laughs> We might not have to work to abolish the Olympics. Like they might, they might just burn themselves out. But um, like truly, I, I like I really, I, I don't think we as an organization recognize that enough. Like they're they're doing the work for us so often, and and these you know of course like Tokyo uh, just made it so much more obvious, um, and it has and really just proved the like what we've been saying for so long but made it you know a lot like a lot so a lot more obvious and right. you know now again it doesn't really feel like a fringe idea right right i think that's 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 there's no way to, w better way to end this than uh that quote that uh the olympics the ioc might abolish the olympics themselves <laughs> Uh, really, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Where can people find more information about your organization and what you guys are doing? So follow No Olympics LA on Instagram, on Twitter. 
again on SoundCloud if you want to listen to the radio programs, which are really good, really, really good. I don't, I'm not involved in the production, but the people who are are the coolest. Um, yeah, follow us there. And if you're in LA, there's an event tomorrow with Jules Boykoff and a ton of other really like important and like just yeah. <laughs> no, sounds good to me. Yeah. Uh, go go like if you're in LA, Stories is hosting an event um, or a panel, and it's going to be interactive. And so, if you have any questions or if you want to share your own experiences, like that'll be part of the whole thing. Um, and yeah, Gia Lappi, organizer with No Olympics LA. Check out. Her piece in the Jacobin link is in the description to this YouTube uh, uh, live stream and on the Patreon, and I'll include it in the podcast description when the podcast version of this interview goes up. Uh, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Have a great, uh, have a great night. Thank you. Take care. Me too. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Man, I, I can't get over some of this stuff that I was reading about the Olympics. I mean, it is uh, just, uh, we didn't even get to the vast majority of it. Like we just basically gave you guys a quick overarching summary of the main situations. There's just so much going on there. Um, and the Olympic opening ceremony for Tokyo games is tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, anyway, we're going to go to the second half of the show where I have a, I honestly, this might be one of the best, I shouldn't say that because then I'm going to uh, uh, obviously not live up to expectations. So I don't know if this will be the best second half of the show we'll ever have. But the stories I want to talk about should potentially provide some really good material. Um, <laughs> so let's get to the second half of the show. Before I do, patreon.com slash mattbinder. Uh, to support this show, folks, uh, we received uh, a few new patrons over the past week. Uh, and as I always do, I want to shout those people out because obviously they are a huge part of the program. Hold on. Let me uh, get this up here. Where is the list of patrons? Come on. One second. Here we go. What was last Thursday? The 15th, right? Okay. So joining the Patreon since the last show last week, Vince, thank you so much for becoming a patron. Mitch W., thank you for supporting the show. Joshua S., thank you. Lisa L., I appreciate you becoming a patron. Uh, Anthony D., Soy B, Chase B, and Helen, thank you all for becoming a patron. I appreciate it so much. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of this month, uh, July saw a number of patrons having to, uh, you know, for various financial reasons or otherwise, leave this, uh, were unable to continue supporting the show. So uh, we're almost back, thanks to all of you, to our previous peak. Um, we're almost literally like a quarter, we're about a quarter of the way for like this show to be like a self-sustaining thing where I could A, uh, hire people, B, uh, I would very much like to bring a co-host for a second weekly program. Uh, and we're like a quarter of the way to like really building out this show. I mean, obviously, quarter of the way sounds far, but it also to me sounds close. Um, quarter is not very much, 25%. Um, so, folks, if you could afford to do so, patreon.com slash Matt Binder. If you can't afford to do so, please don't worry about it. Take care of yourself, take care of your family, do what you need to do. If you ever have some extra money and want to support this show, you could become a patron. Or if you want to give a one-off and you're watching the live stream right now, youtube.com slash Matt Binder or twitch.tv slash Matt Binder, 
come on over to the YouTube live stream where you can drop a super chat, which is basically like a one-off donation. I will read all comments connected to a super chat for sure. Um, you can also support this show by leaving a I, I, iTunes, no more iTunes, Apple Podcasts review, or leave a review wherever you listen to a, your podcast. There's a lot of reviews out there. Uh, for links on where you could do that, rate this podcast dot com slash doomed will provide you with a list that's rate this podcast dot com slash doomed seriously just especially apple Podcasts, it's a big help in getting this show out there just go there hit how many stars you think the show is worthy of leave a quick written review if you have a, a couple of extra minutes really appreciate if you do that uh if you want to listen to the audio version of this program doomedcast.com is where you'll find it uh, follow me on social media at Matt Binder on Twitter, Instagram. Just search Matt Binder wherever you're on, and you'll probably find me on there. How much I use those platforms is uh, another question, but I'm definitely always using Twitter and YouTube. So those are the main two. And I'm simulcasting on Twitch, so that too. Uh, what else? I think that's all for now, folks. Um, before going to the second half of the show, give me a quick second to uh get myself a drink because i forgot the my my uh my my soda if you can believe it so i'm like uh bustling along here i've got low blood sugar at this point um oh i wanted to read a um quick podcast review so that you guys know you know give you an example of some of the the reviews i get here here's a quick one um doomed laughed at, laugh out loud and informative thanks matt for keeping us informed of all the crazy right wingers and misinformation and still keeping it light and entertaining that's from best bingo game out there um i don't know if i've already read this one but here's another one future tim says matt binder is doing good work anybody saying otherwise is probably QAnon, LOL. I love that one. All right, folks, give me a minute to get my uh, get a drink. And uh, we got tons of things to talk about, tons of stories. I'll give you a little, a little taste. We got uh, this crazy, uh, these crazy rumors that spread about AOC online this past week. We got an interesting... Uh, study on uh, police officers who are dying in the line of duty and uh, how they're dying exactly uh, shouldn't shock you, but that's certainly not how the police are framing it. And uh, what else? There's another one I had, right? Uh, there's a few actually. Oh, let me drop this. The caller system. How did I forget? I will be opening up the phone lines on Skype. Call in. Download Skype if you don't already have it. If you do, just open up your Skype. Search Doomed Live and you could call into this program. Uh, all right, folks. Going to the second half of the show now. You can stick around if you're watching it on the live stream. You can stick around, obviously, if you're a patron. Um, if you're not watching live, if you're not a patron, then I will see you all next time. On Doomed.
All right. I am back. Uh, well, first you got to see me. Hello, everyone. I'm back. Um, oh, we got a new patron just as uh, I uh, sat down to my chair here after getting my soda. Um, thank you, Carl, for becoming a patron. I really appreciate the support. Um, you will get another shout out, shout out next week on the first half of the show so everyone can hear you. Ooh, we're uh, who's going to be the 240th patron? That's uh, that could be you, if you're obviously uh, if you're watching if you're not watching live, then um, you know. The uh, you already are a patron, but if you are watching live, maybe that could be you, the two hundred and fortieth patron. Did I say two hundred fourth at first? Two hundred fortieth. I want to be clear. Um. Let's go. Oh, let me sign into Skype. I will read some super chats too in one second. Uh, live. Da, 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 da. We are on Skype now. Doomed live. Call in. I keep forgetting the password. There we are. Doomed live. Um, oh, Abby's comment caught my eye before because uh, it felt like a flex. Where is this? And I wanted to read it. It's not a super chat comment, but sometimes Abby says, my cousin is an Olympic gold medalist. Olympics are lame and definitely problematic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just wanted to say your cousin is a, an Olympic gold medalist, didn't you, Abby? What uh what did your cousin win? What sport was your cousin? Um What sport does your cousin play? And let me go to Uh, oh, Samantha Sider is basically both super chats so far. I can't see her other one for some reason. What happened to the other super chat? That's weird. Well, I'll see what happened to it, but you sent one in the beginning at the very top of the show. And uh, here's this latest one. Matt, you should at everyone on Discord when you have your surprise stream. I have to fix the Discord. It's still broken. <laughs> Uh, if you're a patron, I'm going to send you out and you haven't received your Discord link. I will get it to you ASAP. Uh, I promise. Um, ooh, we got that 240th patron, it looks like. Jason, AFC, thank you so much for becoming a patron. I really appreciate it. You'll get another shout out next week on the, free half of the, the first half of the show for sure uh, as well. Damn, the, the next the next uh, frontier is 250. 10 more and we're at 250. Um, and then we're really cooking here, right? Um, let me see. Do we have any callers yet? Doomed live on Skype. If not, no big deal. I will go to one of the stories I wanted to do. Let me pull up everything I need. Give me one second. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Let me grab a drink too. I had to tell you guys is um, this summer has been rough doing this show in here. Because I'm in this small little closet of a studio that I told you guys about, and it's hot in here. <laughs> it's hot in here, but uh, I'm 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 pulling through for you. Uh, all right, let's do this. Okay, so I'm on Twitter. A couple days ago, and I come across this tweet 
from the former commissioner of the former police commissioner, I should say, of the NYPD, Bill Braddon. And in this tweet, Braddon says, Cops are doing what they have always done regardless of politics or anti-police sentiment. Risking it all, running toward da- towards danger. 2021 has seen a 10% increase in line-of-duty deaths versus 2020, which is the second highest on record. Now, you see what's going on here. Braddon is clearly playing up this idea that there is this vast uh, anti-police movement because of Black Lives Matter, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests of last summer that happened in the wake of the police killing of George Floyd. And they've really been trying to play up this whole thing. You know, obviously people have been flying, people who support, um, you know, right-wingers who support Trump have been flying there. Uh, thin blue line flags, and you have this really demonization of any sort of movement to defund the police, which is basically a movement to not give the police this vast sum of money, extra sum of money, really, actually, every year, just so they could buy militarized equipment for lo- you know th- the cities they're supposed to serve and protect. So this is really meant to gin that up. And when you read just this tweet, oh, wow, cops uh, are are risking it all, running towards danger during this anti-police sentiment and all these politics that are working against police officers. And wow, 2021 has seen a 10% increase versus last year, which is the second highest on record in terms of uh, on-duty deaths from police forces. Now, if you click that link in Braddon's tweet, you will be taken to that 2021 mid-year law enforcement officer fatality report. And if you open up that report, you will find, let me pull up this chart in there. It came in really large. Let me make it a little bit smaller. Here it is. You will find this chart, and it says law enforcement fatalities by decade, 1960 through 2020. And this is just through mid-year. So this chart is for each one of these years, and it's just for January through June, the first six months, mid-year. And... You'll look at this chart and you'll say to yourself, wow, look how high that chart goes, right? It's You see it starts in the 1960s where there's uh, around 70 uh, on-duty police officer deaths. And then you go through the 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s and you see it go up and down a little bit. But then all of a sudden you come to 2020. And it just skyrockets. Got 140 law enforcement deaths in the first six months of 2020. On-duty deaths, I should say. And then here we are. This year, 155 fatalities. Now, here's the thing. Pull that chart up. Like, lift it up a little bit. You'll see me doing it on the screen. Lift it up a little bit. I'm going to make this really big. What do you see there? What do you see right there? The breakdown of these on-duty fatalities from January to June. 155 total. You'll see some firearm-related, some traffic-related, a handful of ones listed as other. And then there it is. 71 of those 155 fatalities, 71 due to COVID-19. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, if you remove those COVID-19 deaths, 71 from 155, you actually have those total fatalities down to around 80 some odd, which puts it in line 
with every other year on this chart. And by the way, you should look at how weird this chart is. It skips five years. It goes 1960, then 1965, 1970, and then at the very end, 2015, 2020, and then 2021. So that also skews it tremendously. Uh, that 2021 is the one year not included in the five-year jump between every other one. But that regardless, take away those COVID deaths and you have a on-duty uh, fatality uh, number pretty much in line with every single year since the 60s and actually lower than what it was for the 70s, 80s, and part of the 90s. So, I mean, and also you might be saying, but Matt, these uh, police officers, you know, they are on the front lines. They're going out there and they're, you know, they're putting their lives on the line to serve and protect during the pandemic. Well, I'll tell you this. There was a huge issue in New York, specifically. I'm going to stick with a New York take. I'm sure uh, your cities have seen, uh, wherever you live, have seen something similar. But I'm going to stick with New York here. This was a common sight in New York throughout the entire pandemic. Police officers in mass not wearing masks. This is from summer of last year, the heights of the pandemic. I see one officer in this photo. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. I think there's twenty-four cops in this photo. One, one is visibly two. There's the one all the way in the back. Two visibly wearing a mask. Now remember, they're putting, uh, they don't want to care about themselves. That's their own uh, whatever. But they are working a public facing job. Who knows what they spread by not wearing a mask? And this was a common occurrence. Common. I mean, there's photo after photo. If you want, I'll, I'll even pull up some of these uh, photos here from the protests. Uh, here's another one I'll, I'll bring up from the protest last summer. Um, give me one second to pull this up. Just, you know, cops just not wearing masks. It's just stunning. Here we go. Another photo. How many cops in this photo? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cops in this photo, one wearing a mask. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, Matt, you know, um, people are vaccinated now. They don't have to wear masks. Sure, sure, sure. People are vaccinated now. They don't have to wear masks. In New York, it's true. If you're fully vaccinated, you uh, the, the, the recommendations say you don't have to wear a mask. You don't got to wear a mask indoors unless the specific establishment requires it. Um, you're free to not wear a mask in uh, NYC anymore if you're going by the local ordinances. Uh, but here's the thing. If you're not, if you're vaccinated, but here's the thing. Uh, again, uh, emphasis on if you're vaccinated. This coming from NBC New York, the local NBC affiliate, Channel 4 News. The overall NYPD vaccination rate between police officers and professional support staff is about 43%, the department said in a statement Wednesday. New York's vaccination rates in the 70s, I believe New York City specifically is a little bit lower, um, probably uh, due to a number of reasons maybe. I, I, I don't know exactly, but I think it's like in the mid-60s. But still, that vaccination rate, much higher than the NYPD's vaccination rate. I'm also going to guess that that addendum that extra addition of professional support staff also adds to that vaccination rate. I'm going to assume that's actually why they're including it in the percentage, because I'm sure if you include just police officers and not, you know, administration or whatever else is included in professional support staff, maybe medical, um, 
I'm sure if you don't include that, that number's much lower. So, again, that Braden tweet trying to really promote the idea that cops are dying in mass because of they're running into danger towards anti-police sentiment is just not accurate. They're dying in record numbers because cops just aren't getting vaccinated and taking precautions and they are dying mostly due to the pandemic. It's just, you know, it's stunning. All right, folks, let's go back to the um, comments here. Let me pull up uh, Super Chats. I saw some come through. Samantha with a Super Chat. Olympics should only be in Greece if it exists at all. I mean, I guess that would solve the issue if it was just in one specific area, right? Um, but that's not what it's all about, like we discussed with uh, Gia. Uh, we got a call. Let me take it. Hi, you are on the air. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is um, uh, James GK from Chicago. I'm the uh, kind of reformed crypto bro that messaged you on Twitter a few days, well, about a week ago. Oh, okay. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing uh, crypto. I, you know, I feel like... <laughs> I know it's everybody's favorite topic. I mean, uh, really, I honestly, I get a real joy out of discussing it. I find it to be so fun to talk about. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not even being sarcastic. I, I'm a masochist. I enjoy getting into fights with the crypto bros on Twitter. And uh, unfortunately, none, no, uh, no one's really called into this show. There was the one guy who had a very nice, productive discussion with me about why he liked crypto and specifically, I actually, I think his discussion was specifically why he liked blockchain technology and was, was sort of not completely uh, down with crypto in, in, in to the total of, of the totality of all things, excuse me. Right. But um, what would you like to talk about? Uh, so I actually kind of want to have a, a little bit of a meta conversation here. I want to talk like... I don't want to try to convince you about anything about blockchain or crypto itself. I more want to talk about how we criticize cryptocurrencies uh, because there's certain ways that I have found um, specifically like on MR that were counterproductive and kind of caused me to tunnel deeper into that community where then like some of the same points that were discussed by people like brett scott or when you look into mutual credit systems uh kind of handled those criticisms in a lot better way and that kind of pulled me out right uh so right, i kind of want i definitely want to hear this but i also want to add, add a quick dis disclosure here you know I, I am not a financial person i i am not a financial expert or have mm -hmm. any expertise in that area uh, you should not come to me to finance advice, right. stock advice, anything, or, or I'm going to say the majority poor too. I'm sure uh, some of them might have a little bit more or some of them have even a little bit less knowledge as me, but again, not financial experts. So uh, for someone who is drawn to that stuff, yes, I'm going to uh, just disclose, admit to myself that uh, we probably aren't the best people if you're looking for that financial discussion. And if that's what you're looking for, we might turn you away because we're focused on other aspects of it for sure. Right. Um, I mean, kind of more what my world is and what was into, uh, you know, I'm I'm on the spectrum. So uh, it, it was really the monetary theory aspect of it that was super interesting to me. Um, you know, I can kind of go into what initially dragged me up. If we want to make this conversation that I don't want to take up too much of your time. Cause it sounds like you got like a, a nice full show already. No, actually I, I'm very into, you know, you don't have to go really deep into it, but I would love a, a quick summary of basically like what drew, first of all, what drew you to crypto? What took you, uh, what that we said, uh, did not, you know, appeal to you. And then what did help you become a reform crypto bro? So first let's start with. Why, how'd you get into crypto in the first place? Uh, so I uh, got into crypto uh, just kind of uh, nonchalantly at the beginning of the pandemic. You remember the, the Fed lowered the interest rate. Uh, oh, so, so I just want to, not to interrupt you, but I, I was expecting someone who got into this years ago. You, you This is quite recent. It is a 
it's a fast turnaround. Wow, this is like yeah, this is like <laughs> yeah, a, so the, this the, is a like reverse a year and a half, maybe less. Jeez, to to to, to try to I'm going to try to be a financial bro here. This is like a reverse hockey stick chart, right? I mean, <laughs> oh oh yeah yeah absolutely. Uh, we saw a full ABC correction uh, off of my trajectory here. Um, uh, but uh, so. I had a high interest account that then suddenly the interest rate on that went under the rate of inflation. And I was like, what the hell? I'm going to gamble with this now. Uh, so that's that's where then I kind of started looking into the crypto uh, currencies as just uh, like I already had stuff in the stock market, but like. Uh, it's the New York Stock Exchange and Kelly Loeffler's husband owned it. And I didn't want to put more money into something uh, that was essentially so close to the GOP. And so I was like, well, I'm going to gamble with this money over here in this other thing. Um, you know, the late stage capitalism, right? There's no ethical form of consumption. So I might as well gamble in this casino over this other casino was my mindset going right. in. Um, so... I'm like, uh, you know, doing okay. I make a little bit of money. Uh, what did you? Which, what, what's, what cryptos did you uh, uh, go into? Um, I I went into uh, mostly proof of stake uh, cryptocurrencies because there had already been some of that kind of talking about how proof of work is just this huge electricity sink. Uh, and so I'd go, uh, I mean, the ones that I went in, uh, were, uh, Algorand, Tezos, um, t -t 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 uh, oh, so you Cosmos. Went, you went deep. It's not like you opened up Robinhood and grabbed some Bitcoin. Well, or... I opened up, I op here's what I did. I opened up Coinbase, uh, created an account with them and the cryptocurrencies that paid a staking, uh, return like a dividend were the ones that I decided to fuck with. So how does that, uh, so for people who don't, who don't know, how does, how does, why don't you explain how, uh, you know, really short, how staking works? Uh, so um, in essence, uh, staking is, uh, the way it works on Coinbase is as long as I own the coin, I get paid back a little bit of dividend through Coinbase. And the reason this works is they're, they're putting that currency up as stake, uh, which is an alternative form to like proof of work. So in proof of work, uh, you have to play that stupid guessing game. And whoever wins the stupid guessing game gets the uh, $200,000 worth of Bitcoin. Um, in proof of stake, uh, you kind of prove your loyalty to the project by owning a lot of that particular coin. Um, and by not spending that coin, you prove that you have the right to be a validator. Um, and as long as you have that money kind of frozen in that stake form, uh, they'll kick you back some of that coin you're staking as a thank you for, for not spending this coin. Sort of like a, 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 in, in a traditional bank, I guess, like a savings account, right? Uh, it is, it is kind of like a savings account. Um, that's that's a that's an easy way to to put it. Um, you can kind of think of the staking fee as uh, interest because I mean when you go and buy deposits in a staking depo uh, uh, in a <laughs> savings account, uh, you know the bank some of that money might go to the reserves, but they're making profits off of the other. So that's that's a pretty good um, comparison. Yes. Right. So you, you go into – so the, the beginning of the pandemic, you have this extra money, which kudos to you for realizing that you were basically gambling uh, and not uh, you know investing in the currency of the future. Uh, <laughs> so congratulations on that front right off the bat. Um, right. Because, again, if that's what you want to do – uh, you know, you're, we're all adults here. If you, yeah. you know, you can, uh, what my issue is, is people who, uh, are treating this as something more than just right. a casino. Uh, right. so you do that. And so you, I guess are making some money and obviously this makes you like crypto, right? Who wouldn't like, well, not quite. Ah, right. Okay. So it's, it's gambling, right? So your emotional investment in gambling doesn't necessarily come when you're making money 
the big emotional uh, moment is when uh, the the market tanks, right? When you know, with the the gambler at the slot machine, they're excited as long as they're feeding into the slot machine. Uh, it's it's when they're spending money that you're getting that dopamine fix. Uh, the the dopamine fix from from getting returns out uh, has diminishing returns that are much faster than that. So it's actually when I sustain sustain my first big loss, which is kind of uh, during the the big NFT craze. Uh, there was a coin called Filecoin that like was seeing 20% jumps every day. And I'm like back and forth on whether or not I'm going to go in on this thing. And I'm, I, I sit on my own nuts and I end up buying it right at its peak. Um, and it's, it's right when, you know, it's not a lot of money, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I ended up off of my investment losing probably, uh, I want to say about 15% on that. Uh, cause I, I, I kind of realized what I did and I got out reasonably quick. Um, but after that, that's when it's like, well, now I'm going to start like reading into this. Now I'm going to like, you know, I saw that I can make money. I saw that there is kind of some game theory going on here. There's like a deeper market to understand. And so that's kind of what dragged first dragged me in was not that I was making money, but it was actually kind of that that first big loss uh and there is there's a thing in like the uh at least some of the investing community where they talk about uh 90 percent of investors lose 90 percent of their initial investment within the first 90 days uh and then that's how you know you've you've kind of like started your life as an investor uh and so that that is kind of what what was true in in my instance um so damn so you, I, lo losing money dug you deeper in that's yeah well i mean i got i gotta say i know i know I, i'm not a much of a gambler either even though uh let me tell you uh blackjack makes a lot more sense as an investment <laughs> to me than uh than crypto uh, right. but um but you know for me if i had lost uh money in something like crypto uh, I would certainly immediately uh, never do that again. Like that's just the type of person I am. Losing mo if right. I if I lost money somewhere, you can guarantee. Like if I purchase something and I'm not satisfied with my purchase, and I even get like a, an object, like I feel like like if I go to like and have like an ice cream cone and I don't I pay for an ice cream cone two three bucks and I don't like it, I can guarantee you I will never go back to that ice cream place again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. That's a fair point, uh, uh, you know, t definitely taken. Uh, but, you know, it's it's kind of that, like, um, you know, what I would have convinced myself that I was doing is I was, you know, I was learning the game so that I could be the one who made the money off of the stupid thing next time. Uh, it's a, a little, a little bit of the 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 PVP nature in me came right. out. With no, I, listen, I I sort of, I, you know, I. Again, I, I get it to an extent. Like, I totally understand. Like, obviously, people have a gambling addiction issues. And, right. I mean, I'm not saying that's what you had, but it obviously stems from that. They just happen to have, like, a really more pronounced version of, of you know, right. really t takes over their life. But uh, let's move on now to, mm -hmm. were you searching out, uh, you know, things that criticized crypto or... Uh, what was the next step here? So you're you're investing in crypto, you're losing money, it's making you double down. Now, when you say double down, did you all of a sudden become one of those people who were like, crypto is the future, this is going to be the next currency, or this is going to change the world, and you know, so there'll be no more poverty and all this other ridiculousness right. that the crypto people believe? I mean, uh, it, there's a nuance to it. I didn't think that it was going to ever replace the like U.S. dollar or fiat currencies. But when there are some of these projects that uh, really brand themselves with collectivist uh, uh, branding, right. uh, you know, uh, Stellar Lumens, the first uh, like when it 
first hit the market, its big push was that it was going to be this like huge game changer for the for the unbanked population. Or uh, Silo Coin talks about how like it's going to bring uh, these financial uh, products that people can buy in the first world over into the global south. And so there's they really in their white pages uh there's a lot of these uh projects that on the surface and what they're trying to describe that their 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 aspirations are very uh um their aspirations seem very leftist uh from like when you're just skimming through the white page uh the the problem then is that uh, their monetary theory behind that aspiration is incredibly conservative. Uh, and so it wasn't until my interest started kind of blossoming into how money works and monetary theory uh, like plays out that I was like, oh, the problem wasn't the money. The problem was the system that the money is in. Uh, like... I can. I think I kind of skipped uh, ahead there in my 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 story, but if you followed, <laughs> let me know. I, yeah, so 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 basically, you you sort of became one of those people. Not not like entirely would change everything, but you know, the, the, the some of these coins sold you on the idea that it can change aspects of the world. I guess. Yes. Yes. It definitely. Um, without understanding the technological limitations of the of blockchain because you know it kind of became the it's a bit snake oily uh in that people are like uh, rub blockchain on your your knee and it will like it'll lower the inflammation right uh now, now here's uh, here, here's the thing that like baffles me about like the 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 because i had someone give me an example of sort of what you're talking about, how, you know, a coin, the leftists should be on top of this because a coin can change the world. And they said to me, imagine you had a coin, let's call it mutual aid coin, and you can use it to raise money, to do things, and and use this mutual aid coin to, to you know, to, to, to raise these funds. And, and all I kept thinking of was, all right, we let's just say we do this, and I have this mutual aid coin. What do I what do I do with it when I need to purchase the items and these basic necessities that apparently mutual aid coin is going to help me buy? I go to the store and I say, "Hey, I have a hundred mutual aid coins," uh, and the uh, the general store cashier will say to me. Uh, what the fuck is this? Like, it doesn't do anything. Like, it doesn't mean anything. Like, I, it always just like, why are you giving an extra step here? Just raise U.S. dollars if you're in the United States, obviously, and you will be able to raise money and spend money instead of go through all these random transactions, spend all this money on fees, just to be able to have a gimmick where you're saying you're using something called mutual aid token or whatever. Right. I mean, like, the only kind of thing that I would say there's a grain of truth in is, you know, let's say uh, that you are a, a despot of your, your own country and you guys, your country gets hit by an earthquake and the UN wants to give you money to rebuild the infrastructure of your country. Um, a, I can conceivably see where a decentralized ledger of how that money f flows through your economy could be helpful for the UN to keep track of. Everything else you said kind of sounded like imagination land uh, and like hopeful thinking. Right, right. You know, even even that scenario, sort of. I mean, because we know that. See, here's the thing, too. Like, the the argument that th there's two sides to this coin, right? And and again, you can correct me if you think I'm wrong here. There are cryptocurrency advocates who are talking out of both sides of their mouth when they talk about the benefits of the blockchain. Oh, one hundred percent. Oh, we have this ledger where everything is tracked. All this, these transactions are tracked. We can see what 
money and what amount is going from wallet to wallet. Everything is the public record. Okay. And then you have those same people saying cryptocurrency is the most private way you can send money. It's no one can find. It's like, are you kidding me? Like one or the other. It's not both. It can't right. both be. It's like, it, are you kidding me? Like, first of all, uh, if I use my bank, you know who can find out what I'm like? Let's say I go out and use my debit card. You know who could find out what I'm purchasing? Uh, the federal government, if they issue like a subpoena on my bank, they, that's pretty much it. Yeah. No yeah. one can log online and check out my transaction. So if you're looking for a secure way to make sure no one knows what you're buying, uh, that, you know, obviously illegal, so illegal items aside. Uh, what I would push back here uh, from being inside, they're not cons the the there are multiple groups of people within the crypto community, right? Uh, and the one kind of consensus, the one like through line through all of them is their problem is not it, some of them. The problem is definitely that the government can see it, but all of them. The problem is the private for profit bank can see your transactions and track you uh the uh, the kind of the you know i don't know necessarily how true this is the mythology but the bitcoin people they point to the 2008 banking crisis as the why these projects are being worked on and built on uh, because in the crypto community, are you familiar with uh, M1 money and M0 money? No. Uh, okay, so like uh, cash is M0 money. Cash is something we all collectively own. The government prints cash, right? Right. So then M1 money would be if I then go to a bank and I buy deposits from the bank. Um, so I hand over the, the cash that is printed from the government over to the bank. They might put that in their reserves. They might invest that, but the ownership of the money that I'm depositing into the bank is now the bank's money. They own the cash. I own a, uh, what used to be a slip of paper, but is now a balance on a spreadsheet that you can look up online that has a debit card associated with it. And that's called a deposit. I mean, I mean, but that's not true though. Like sure. You give them your, your, let's say you take a $20 bill and draw a little funny mustache on Jackson. Uh, they're not going to obviously take your little $20 bill with the funny mustache and put it in a little tin box for you. And when you want that $20, that exact $20 bill back, you ain't going to get the Jackson with the funny little mustache back, but you deposit, Ten thousand dollars. At any time, you can go back to that bank at any, and exchange at any your bank. deposit for the money. Right. So you always own it. It's never not yours. Sure, that exact ten thousand dollars in physical cash is not. Uh, you're not going to get that exact ten thousand dollars back. But if you no longer owned it, then you wouldn't be able to get it back. Um. No. Um, I mean, I'm not trying to. No. Uh. It. When you put money into a checkings account, it becomes something that when in monetary theory is called near money or M1 or bank money. Think of it as like phases of matter. Um, a, a more helpful way to think of this is a you're going to a casino. You go up to the, the desk, you buy poker chips for $200, right? They hand you the poker chips for $200 at any point that you're in the casino, you can cash those poker chips in and get your money back. Right. That's that's the checking system. Uh, so it, like, what affects us in our day-to-day -day lives, you're, you're correct. We can spend M0 and M1 and not really think too much about it. Uh, and I'm actually for that. I'm for having debit a debit system i'm for having a credit system my only problem is that uh within the debit system and the credit system you have uh the bank can issue out new m1 
uh, in the form of loans. And those loans don't actually need to be backed by their reserves. Uh, so the banks, private banks are actually issuing out money into our economy. And I would much rather a publicly owned bank, like a postal banking system. Oh, yeah, I agree uh, with that completely, for where, sure. Where the, it is the government that is issuing out our currency. Um, and well. then we... Isn't that sort of? I mean, obviously, uh, listen. I, I don't. I don't. I can't speak too much to loans because uh, I mean, I don't know all the the, the machinations behind that. But um, uh, I mean, the government sort of does. Uh, obviously, I agree with you completely. Postal banking would be great. I would immediately move to a, a sort of public institution like that. Absolutely, one hundred percent agree with you totally. Um, and I'm certainly not defending the current banking system. You know, I uh, despise the big banks, I'm sure, as much as uh, the crypto bros do, but I obviously would... for, for different reasons. Right. Um, I mean, what I um, uh, and what I would suggest, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm autistic, so I'm trying to. I, I gotta not tell you, I got to I, emotional I, reactions. I gotta tell you, you're uh, doing you're doing fantastic. You are. Uh, extremely well spoken. You are extremely precise, and you are presenting this in quite an entertaining, charismatic way. So I wouldn't worry about that at all. I would okay, seriously not worry about that at all. You're not you're like even if you were just worried about not be like just getting the information out there and not worried about being boring. You're not even being boring. You're coming across okay. very very good. So don't worry about that <laughs> okay. at all. So stick yeah. to, so stick to the the content. Don't worry about the presentation. You're doing great. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I do. I kind of. Uh, and we like just kind of jumped right in here. Uh, um, I, I think um, useful reading uh, would be Brett Scott, Brett with two T's, Scott with two T's. Um, he is, uh, he talks a lot about finance. He's also an anthropologist. Um, um, and he, uh, I mean, where he would have gotten a notoriety is he's he's he was a vocal critic of uh, the um, uh, there was a big move in the UK, which was for for a cashless society. They wanted to try and get rid of the cash system, the pound. Uh, and he was like, this is a terrible idea uh, and got a lot of pushback and got labeled as a conspiracy theorist uh, for that. But uh, his work is very good at taking complex ideas and making them accessible. Um, and he's uh, small on stuff. It's Soup Possum on Twitter. Uh, he might be an interesting get if you can wrangle I'll him. To check him out. I, I want to get uh, David I'm, I'm uh, David Gerard on this show. I've spoken to him before, before for other things I was working on. But I right. think he's a obviously they seem different. Brett, see, your, your guy seems much more of a overall financial guy, whereas David Gerard is specifically someone who knows about uh, cryptocurrency and and criticizes right. it quite uh, quite good actually. I think he's one of the best. Um, yeah, um, I mean, uh, if I went into what exactly you know, uh, kind of pivoting towards. Uh, the the meat here. Oh yeah. So what uh, what turned you away from that that I said that when what what did you not like about my crypto uh, criticisms? Uh, so there um if I there were a few arguments you made where I kind of uh, would agree with your overall point, but uh, it was a little discrediting like how you got there. Some details were certain were a little discrediting. Uh. uh I have a like. It doesn't fit, uh, but um, like, so. And uh, I kind of want to start where I'm going to sound more critical. Like I always believed that you were a thoughtful person who was uh, like giving the information that, as you understood it. Uh, and I like, and I, I think of you as a very uh, like I respect your opinion a lot, and that's kind of why I had the emotional reaction I had when there was like something that was, seemed a little discrediting. So like I knew you had like come across this concept of of like altcoins, uh, and had said so, like you know there's and I, I I think it was a joke. So I, this is probably just. You know, like I said in our initial back and forth, some of this is probably more indicative of me and where I was than of you. Um, 
but like that they're shit coins and i was like yeah the the people who call that shit coins are the people who are in bitcoin because altcoin just means everything that's not bitcoin right uh and so it was like uh like pure emotional uh response uh which is illogical because you know that's the nature of emotions um was that was like okay so here i am hanging out in my 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 little algo coin corner here and like uh the left is like throwing a a a a bitcoin supremacist uh talking point at me and if if like it felt a little like judgy. Oh, I uh, could I could assure you I hate Bitcoin just as much as all the others. Oh, I mean, I in the depths of my crypt, I have never hated Bitcoin more than when I was emotionally invested in the market. Uh, it is it is the oldest project. It is the project that has the most attention in the media. Uh, so it's the prettiest girl at the dance, and you you just you just want her to trip and fall. And I think <laughs> I think that like that Schadenfreude urge, that wanting to be a part of Bitcoin finally falling on its face, was probably another emotional tie that I had to that community. Now, doesn't though? Wouldn't that have affected you though? Because every yes. everything I've seen here, even though you hate Bitcoin. Well, the entirety 100%. of cryptocurrency is tied to Bitcoin. Bitcoin goes up, everything else goes up. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's different levels of that, and some coins will, will you know, go up higher, and some will go up lower. But pretty much, Bitcoin uh, lays out the uh, the the track of the day, I guess you can say. Right, and the way I convinced myself was that. Uh, Yes, it would hurt my investment if Bitcoin ate shit and died, but also would have been the best thing for the cryptocurrency community because they would no longer have to answer for the faults of Bitcoin. So it was like a, a yes, this thing would be a this thing would probably be a black swan, but if if then the cryptocurrency community survived that black swan event then it would be stronger than ever because it no longer had to carry the baggage of this uh this gold standard with uh uh this like cyborg gold standard that they had built up um and so it was absolutely something that would be uh detrimental but you st i still wanted to see it uh, <laughs> right. you know and i can still enjoy if it implodes from the sideline so where uh, where, so where are you now so you're you're completely out of uh out of crypto you're 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 negative on it i have um i have a small amount of money still sitting in those staked coins where i play the fun gamble game uh time to time uh, but most of my savings are then back with like aspiration, uh, because at least, uh, or what? I, uh, aspiration it's, they, they advertise with TYT. They're, they're a bank, but they're an online bank. Oh, okay. Uh, they make pretty promises, but you know, it's capitalism, right? For, uh, a, for a second, I thought you were going to say you put it all into another coin, and this one is. Uh, I put it all on backed red. By, backed by <laughs> TYT, and I was like, "Wait, what? Jank is an influ one of those influencers I've been covering, and I missed it. What? What's going on?" <laughs> oh no! Nothing would kill John Iderola faster than if TYT came out with a cryptocurrency. Oh, I think he, he's big. Oh, he he is physically in pain when he's forced to talk about it. Uh, I mean, it's, I do. Someone, someone told me that, and I haven't looked into this. So if it's wrong, and, and I don't know the details of it, but someone told me that David Pakman had done some crypto advertising. And I, I listen, you won't see any crypto ads on this show. Guarantee you won't see any ads on this show right now. Period. But uh, you won't see any crypto ads on this show. Guaranteed. Besides the ones that uh, YouTube puts on this that i have no say over someone told me that i when i uploaded a uh, one of my crypto segments as a solo video because cryptocurrency was in the title 
they got a crypto ad. I can't control that. It's out of my hands. Oh, and the the worst is the 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 crypto card, a metal card. Crypto is the most advanced money we've ever had. Oh, they have cards and all that other like. Oh, it's just a titanium debit card that like you can use at crypto ter- uh, terminals at it like a huge markup. Uh, but yeah, yeah, that's like the the number one ad that I uh, I, I see before yours and tyt's videos i think it's so bizarre that and, and again i'm not talking about anyone we just discussed it's just a general observation i think it's so bizarre that there are people who promote this stuff like if i did invest in cryptocurrency if i was actually even if the stock market like if i was a stock market and if i invested in anything period i would just not share it because i would not want anyone to uh to fall into or maybe that's a bad term because I'm not talking about just scammy things but I wouldn't recommend any or even give the vague notion of recommending something that would be seen as an investment because I just think that's bad form like, well I, just think I that's mean so, it is I just think that's um, so like what if I was an investor whatever I invested would be my own personal business like you should not be sharing that stuff like I guess there's people who are quote unquote good at it so they charge for this as a service i am sure there's you know i'm sure there are pros and cons people will argue to me there i mean i think the whole investment all of it is like whatever i don't even i think i'm very surprised by some of the um and like the you know the 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 obvious pump and dump scams. Uh, there there is regulation against that. It's just uh, are there enough cops? Well. I don't like using that word, but are, are, is the government uh, apparatus, the SEC, actually taking these things seriously? And they they used to have a guy in the SEC who was like tied up in. I think he worked for the Ethereum corp- corporation, uh, and he uh, like came out at one of these crypto conventions. Uh, and he was like, um, uh, Bitcoin's not a security and Ethereum's not a security because they're uh, sufficiently decentralized. Uh, and then he started going after the SEC started going after Ripple. And like there's there's this news out today where Ripple is like, this is unfair because they're not securities and like, but we are. And it's like, really, when you look at it, they're they're speculative assets. These are unlisted oh, that's, securities. That, that is how the like, that's how they're legal, legally looked at. Like you're right in yeah. terms of like, yeah, there are laws that cover crypto. The issue is that there aren't laws that specifically cover crypto. crypto well, and crypto, we're not enforcing them. Right. Uh, right. Well, that's because you know, that's because you know, obviously, when the government's looking for somebody, I mean, they're not going to get uh bernie madoffs every time but that's who they're looking for and the 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 fact of the matter is that you know these cryptocurrency scams are hitting a lot of people who are not traditional investors and are putting in lesser money uh which is probably why more media is covering them because it is something that hits the larger a larger public i guess but at the same time the big money is not there like there is no there's no uh, incentive, really, for... Uh... I can kind of mostly agree with what you're saying. Um, I think some of the aspect of the media coverage of specifically Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Dogecoin is an extension of uh, our media's worshipping of the billionaires. Oh, 100%. Uh, because you got, you got Elon Musk in Doge. You had Mark Cuban uh, singing the praises of Ethereum, and you had uh, Jack Dorsey in Bitcoin, uh, and uh, like those were the people the media were even going to to ask about these projects. It, it's like this. Uh, I so much of the mainstream media coverage is just this this uh, extension of the the billionaire class is here to save us, and I I kind of wonder if that's where some of the uh, you know, rub a little blockchain on it 
uh, ideology comes from is it's uh, it, it just got a little bit of that that sparkle off of our our billionaire deities that walk among us. Right, uh, right. No, that's a great point. I mean, I was bringing up because I guess I'm I'm in right now. I've been covering a lot of the altcoin influencer scam. So for me personally, and the people who I've read that have been covering these altcoin influencer scams, it does seem like that's sort of why they're covering it because it's closer to them in terms of the the type of people who are buying in and the money being spent. But you're absolutely right about the big cryptos like Bitcoin, Ether, uh, Dogecoin, and how the media is obsessed. And here's another example, even when they find a, a, a regular guy. The idea that you would cover that guy who claims to be a Dogecoin millionaire and call him in all those um, headlines a millionaire when the dude refuses to sell – Right. It's not he doesn't have that money. Yet. He's not a millionaire. Right. Yeah. He's not a millionaire. In fact, at the price Dogecoin is right at right now, I don't think he is a millionaire anymore, even on paper. Like he's not a millionaire, period. But even in their description of a millionaire, it's bullshit. It, it doesn't work anymore. And I think it just it drives people into this shit like, oh, if I just buy this this uh, 20 cent uh, token and buy a bunch of them, I too will become a millionaire. And one that's day people... it will hit $1 and then I'll quintuple my, my, my initial investment. And, you know, that's, that's the same chorus you hear right. over and over and over again. Right. Or, it, you know, if it hits $10, then I'm, I'm set for life. And like, right. Well, I really appreciate the call. I really thank you for calling in and, and talking to me for so long about this. Like everyone in the chat right now is probably thinking, damn, Matt really could talk about crypto forever. I, I, I'm, I, I'm sorry to take up so much time. No, uh, you, it's, it's listen, it's my show. And if I wanted to end this uh, 40 minutes ago, I could have. But I, I really right. do find this to be a fascinating topic. Uh, because I hate it so much. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> but I really appreciate the call. Uh, you should call in again, obviously, and we could talk about other things in crypto. Uh, mm -hmm. You were great. Don't worry about any of the the various reasons you were worried because it really was a great call. Uh, there was nothing wrong with it. You were just as good as any, as any other caller. Uh, just last thing, and I'll, I'll jump right off. Uh, AOC put out a public banking bill today. It's not perfect. It's not exactly everything I want, but it is, if it passes, it will help a lot of people's lives in, in the better. So uh, a lot of your representatives are very easy to send an email to. A lot of your senators are also very easy to send an email to. Just go to their, their page and you can usually just fill out and send something real quickly. Um, so the AOC's public banking bill that she put out today, if I was in the House, I would vote for it, even though it's not everything I would want. That, uh, I got an AOC story coming up shortly, so stay tuned. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Yeah, I saw that public uh, banking bill. Uh, I have to look more into it before covering it on the show. Um, oh, I just missed a call from T T Tony, I think. Um, hey, call back in i'll take like a few more calls and then we'll uh oh here we go hey what's your name where are you calling from good evening matt bender it's funky town tony from texas how am i coming in audio wise sounds perfect how you doing what would you like to talk about Outstanding. Uh, well, uh, I guess uh, one thing I wanted to just kind of bring up. Uh, hold on, I'm gonna turn down my phone volume real quick. Um, so um, I just and kind of tying together like the Olympics and the talk about the uh, the police. Um, one of my uh, uh, friends from growing up that I used to do judo with, um, she was in the first Olympics that judo was an event. Uh, made it to the semifinals, had a chance to go back like the next Olympics, and then bailed so that she could become a cop like her dad. It was a real bummer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I honestly was not expecting that story to go that way. I was expecting some tale of like a tr like trials and tribulations, something, some freak occurrence where they couldn't uh, perform anymore. And then you got no. me with the you got me with the becoming just, a cop. That was uh... just poor life choices. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, is there anything else? 
No, I mean, that was it. I uh, just wanted all, to kind of like. That's, re- all I, that's all I need. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for taking my call, Matt. You have a good one. Thank you, Tony. Have a great night. Uh, oh, oh, we got a few missed calls here. Call right back in. Whoever's first, I'll grab you. I see you uh, just uh, just missed me. I'll read a super chat that came up while I wait. Drop your super chat. There's still a few time, uh, some time for super chats. Abby with a super chat says, uh, cops don't wear masks. I deal with cops regularly at my job, and they are never wearing masks. Last year, had a cop show up at my home. No mask. A cab. Uh, I'm taking your call right now. Oh, it hung up on someone just as I took this other call. You're going to have to call back in. The, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, I'm Zoe from Montreal. Zoe. What would you like to talk about, Zoe? Well, I wanted to delve back in the, the dangerous world of policing real quick. Ah, uh, you don't want to talk about crypto? <laughs> nah, I don't <laughs> like crypto. And I also don't understand crypto, so... Hey, that's... Uh, listen, nobody understands crypto. And <laughs> uh, if you don't believe me, uh, you can also know that you don't need to understand crypto according to... Where is this thing I have? One second. Did you... I, I tweeted this out. I just want to share it on the screen right now because it's the All funniest right. thing. You know how the crypto people are always saying when you criticize it, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You should go yeah. do your own research, Right. Yeah. Well, here's Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, just this past week, brand new article posted today. Uh, not today. July 17th, I, I meant. Stop trying to understand Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> we often yeah. utilize complicated systems without understanding them, and this should be no different for Bitcoin. Now, the thing is, I generally agree with that sentiment. Like, you don't have to understand every little aspect and every little inner workings of something to utilize it or take advantage of it or find it useful or use it in your everyday life, obviously. Uh, But it is certainly rich coming from the Bitcoin. Do your own research. You don't understand what you're talking about. You should understand Bitcoin, people. It's just amazing. Yeah. It's basically just saying that you like see, you see what abandoning. I just you see what I just did, Zoe. You called in, not talking, wanting to talk about crypto. Oh my he, god! Here we are talking crypto. Now go ahead with what you wanted to talk about. Yeah, so about like the dangers of police work. Uh, I went ahead and checked on the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics about the fatalities at work. Right. That's a yeah, yes. Thank you for doing that. Tell me. Hit and, it. I'll guarantee. Cops are nowhere up on, like, the heights of, like, the most dangerous jobs on the list. Well, exactly. Let's look. Uh, The most recent data is from 2019, and there were 82 fatalities for cops compared to the highest, which is... I'm going to guess it's, like, lumberjacks or something like that. It's... In clumps, like trade transports and utilities, which oh, okay. is 1,404. Wow. And then goes like in the thousands and all that. But but you might respond, you police-loving, blue lives matter person, that it doesn't take uh, account that there's more people working in construction than in police work. Right. 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 So I went ahead and checked the rate of in, of fatality. Right. In 2019, for the rate for police work was 11.1 per 100,000 full-time workers, as opposed to uh, 14.6 for mining, quarrying, and oil gas extraction, and then 13.9 for transportation and warehousing, and f- the most, the top one is 23.1 for agriculture, forestry, fishing, and hunting. So, even, even taking that, like the amount of people in consideration cops are not 
Adal the most in danger for their jobs. Right, right. I, it, you know, it's it's all just uh, like a, a PR push to uh, basically cover for their own uh, misdeeds, really. The idea that we are supposed to think that police officers are uh, take part uh, in the most dangerous job out there and there is people always looking out to uh, attack and hurt or kill them. Uh, you know, it's it's what they want you to think so they can get away with the things they do without uh, any sort of criticism or consequence or punishment. And th- it, it works, obviously. That's why they do it. Um, it's, yeah. you know, that that's the reason for it, really. Yeah, there's not a lot of shows about the dangers of working on a construction site. <laughs> right, well... You're right, right. Like, you know, there's cops and yes. PD Live or whatever that show is. Right, obviously, yeah. Law and Order. Right, right. I mean, I'm sure there's some sort of, like, construction-esque reality show out there, but... Probably, but... Yeah, it's not, 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 the sa- not even close, right. Yeah. Thanks for the call, Zoe. Really appreciate it. No problem. All right. Uh... Ooh, two people just tried to call in. I, I will take both of your calls. Uh, let's just keep it short and to the point. And um, then I'll do a story or two. And then that's that's the show. Here we go. Hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Oh, God. Is this me? This is you. Uh, how's the... Uh... How's my audio coming through? This is my first time trying to trying to use Skype for this. Oh no, it sounds great. All right, well, hey, this is uh, Chris from Michigan. I usually call in when you're on MR to talk about medical stuff. Oh, how you doing, um, Chris? Uh, I'm doing all right. It's you know, it's today, whatever today it is. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I really don't want to talk about crypto, but if you want to force me to, <laughs> I, I can talk about crypto. Um, I'm I'm. I'm currently a named party in the Mount Gox bankruptcy uh, settlement. Are you uh, really? Since, yes. Uh, I now at my highest point, I was towards like around 20 bitcoins, and with it kept when it kept freezing and crashing when when uh, towards the later days when they found out they were hacked and they went bankrupt, I ended up only down to quote unquote only down to two. But so, like, for all these years, we've all been stuck in this settlement trying to retrieve any percentage of the money we have in there. It's not looking so, good, is it? Uh, I mean, who knows? I mean, the, the thing is, is, like, when I was putting in money, it was at, like, $50 or less. So, I, I you know, at the time, I didn't have... You know, I treated it like a gamble, you know, just like going to the casino or, or playing in the stock market. You know, I didn't sound like I had any true faith in... Or st- in the stability or, you know, long longevity of it as an actual project. But, uh, right, but you he, know, he, the funny thing is I have I have I recently came across old emails. I Sam and I were sending back and forth back when I was a producer at the Majority Port. This must be from 2012 or 2013. Where I was uh, telling him, uh, pitching him uh, as a producer, pitching him story about Mount Gox. And uh, I was saying, oh, you know, Bitcoin's crashing. It's like at 75 bucks now or something like that. And, you know, you look at that email and then you have all these crypto people, whenever I criticize it, and they find my old tweets from that era, too, where I'm knocking uh, Bitcoin. And like, oh, you just wish you bought then. These guys, these noobs in the crypto scene who love it so much, they don't know what it was like to be to even know it existed then here you have and i think you're a great example here i'm fortunately you're a great example here for uh, for you um you know you were someone who got in early but there was not you know the idea that if you just got into bitcoin back when you did and you'd be rich right now it's just not true for the vast majority of people because there were so many situations mount gox being the most famous where, like, even if you got in early, 
you got your you got scammed. You got your shit taken, your money taken away. Like you would you would be. I mean, you wouldn't be uh, uh, super rich, but you'd be pretty well off right now if if that didn't happen. Right, right, ex- exactly. And 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 like I said, like I I knew going into it that I needed to treat it like a trip to the casino, which really like because this was before I ever even tried to do any independent you know, stock picking in the stock market, aside from, you know, just going with 401k or 403b type fun stuff. Um, so I knew that it was a, you know, either a total loss or a big gain thing, but it wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to risk enough money into it that I expected it to make me, you know, like a get like a fucking Dogecoin millionaire type thing, you know? Right. Um, so well, I'm sure on one done, hand, I'm, like, I'm sure you've put in the calculator many times, like, Right, I, I, I did. Oh yeah, yeah. There's always the what ifs. Yeah. Twenty Bitcoin times seventy thousand dollars back in like May. Like oh, one point four million. Oh my god. Right. Yeah. But at the same time, is like even when I when I was because uh, it, it took a while to once you decided to invest, you would have to wire the money to because Mt. Gox is based in Japan, so you'd have to wire the money, and it would take a couple of weeks to get it confirmed. So, like, when I decided to try to invest, it was, like, in the low 20s or high teens, and then by the time I got to buy, it was already in the 50s, 60s. But, you know, years before me, there were people that had spent, like, 100 Bitcoins on a pizza, uh, you know, on, like, right. a random place right. that, they, that took, you know, so, like, think about the misery that those people feel that, like, oh, well, back when it was two cents and I spent a hundred of them on a goddamn pizza. Right. But, well, uh, but my point for bringing that up isn't even to say, like, oh, the mis- – like, it, my point to bring that up is, like, all these cryptocurrency advocates that have sprung out of this – a recent uh, 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 crypto boom. Who are like, oh, if only uh, I, I you knew about you knew about it back then, and you didn't invest. You right, must yeah, be an yeah, idiot. Like that's like, some legitimate criticism of you. Like, the, and to say that that's the only reason that you have a problem with it. It's like, no, you recognize the inherent ridiculous instability and high risk, right, high reward of right. the thing. Yeah. It's because I knew about it back then that I see right. it. Like, damn, even if you did buy it then and did and like played all your cards right on your end you would still get fucked by the system that is cryptocurrency based on all these scam industries that have uh, that's propping up like the fact that you gave mountain gox your money and they basically took it away from you again 50 times 20 obviously not so much but they do pretty much owe you uh, probably more than that even if you did sell later like if you did end up selling before bitcoin peaked it certainly would have been a lot more than 50 bucks Right, yeah. I mean, and, and that was the whole th- again, high risk, high reward. Like, and and that's why the stock market should also be seen as a casino. But obviously, uh, I mean, clearly not regulated enough, but still infinitely less regulated. Uh, or Bitcoin, or, uh, you know, no, I know what crypto you're is is infinitely less regulated compared to the stock market. But obviously, they both need more regulation. Oh, absolutely. So the, and, the know, appeal is also the risk. But uh, and and also like with the stock market, and I've said this before, and this it's not to defend or or say anything positive about the stock market because that's a whole whole shit ton of wrong there too. But you know, at the very least, you know, what, especially I should have brought this up with the caller before who was talking about all his altcoin investments like and the white papers he had to read like those white papers mean nothing at least like on the stock market for again there are some shady stuff on the stock market but for the most part the there you know there's something to look at there you can look at a business and see what they're doing and invest based on that with these altcoins you're basically saying I have to believe what this rando is saying and hope for the best <laughs> like there's nothing even like solid behind it yeah, yeah. I mean, like, like Bitcoin uh, and the and the main crypto stuff was risky enough, and then all the other, like, all the altcoins are analogous to like the penny stocks or less than penny stocks, to where like it's even that much higher of a risk and that much, yeah. So, right. I don't think enough uh, people. Let's move on because I know you want to talk about something else, but I don't think enough people yeah. know about. I don't think enough people know about Mount Gox. I think I need to do an episode on Mount Gox because I think. Yeah. It's um. I mean, cause cause. The, the the main thing with it then and, and like part of the reason that I uh, took a, a buddy's advice to try to invest in the stuff was because it was uh, compared to the stock market like because <clears throat> this was before before Robin Hood and before things were you know before it was more accessible for people to try to to trade on the stock exchange at reasonable cost and uh, 
you, you were dealing with an infinitesimal fucking small percentage per trade, and you could trade 24-7 in any amount, and you could ride it up and down. And it only became a problem when the platforms became, you know, destabilized and when they got hacked and all that stuff. But again, that's just that's the consequence of any any totally unregulated, uh, open to to you know vulnerability type stuff. But right. But but yeah. Any, but anyhow, like because Mount Gox at the time was the biggest. Oh, Mount Gox know, totally yeah, yeah. opened the door for all of what we're at right now. Like before yeah. Mount Gox. There was a whole, like, uh, I mean, Mount Gox made it easy for scammers. I mean, wow, you can easily trade, well, easily in terms of every other way you could have done this before right. Mount Gox. But Mount Gox, an easy way to exchange your digital currency for actual real money that I could use in the real world. Oh, I got to jump in here. Like, Mount Gox is really, like, the the first domino right there. And the fact that it it, it falls and fails it says should say a lot like you know yeah yeah and and again the the low price to try to trade it, it made it more acceptable for more people to jump in the pool and and run the risk because even if you messed up on a few trades like you still weren't paying out compared to what you would for the normal stock market for those trades but um but yeah anyhow crypto <laughs> so, so what did you want to call and what did you um, want to talk about i honestly i don't i don't even know like i, I didn't expect to get through um oh this show but, listen i know you're used to the majority part but this show ain't the majority part there's not a list of oh yeah no i, I a just thousand didn't callers. That, i didn't even think that the skype would thing would work but um <laughs> as as i had said early in the in the chat and you know someone said i was preaching to the choir and like i, I totally recognize that but um I just really wanted to to re 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 encourage everybody. If you haven't gotten your COVID vaccines, please go get them. Please encourage your loved ones to get them. Um, I know Mr. Head, uh, what's his face, the the you know one of the chief, one of the premier virologists in the world. On the other day, you know we're talking about uh, transmission rates anywhere between for every infected person you're seeing between four to eight people getting sick from each additional case and in the early days we were concerned when it was just 1.5 to 2 uh, additional cases per infected person um i don't know how it is uh where you are in new york and where the rest of the listeners are but here in southeast michigan i know damn well that the uh vaccination rate is not anywhere near 97 to 99 percent but every single time i go to the grocery store almost nobody is wearing a mask Um, i'm lucky if i see two people in the whole store wearing a mask Um, so even if you are vaccinated and even if you are low risk uh, i would just encourage people to uh, consider still wearing a mask if it's not a major inconvenience to you uh, if only to uh, combat the uh, the the psychological aspects and herd mentality of humans of seeing okay well no one else is wearing a mask I shouldn't wear one either right I don't want to be part of the out group um, because again even if we do have super high vaccination rates uh, those who have autoimmune conditions and may not be able to get the vaccine or may have infinitely lower efficacy anyone who has had organ transplants and have to be on immune suppressant drugs they may not be able to receive the vaccine or, again, also have lower efficacy. These are just things we don't know for sure yet. You can't make blanket statements. There's too many too many caveats to, to account for. But, um, yeah, as that expert had said, uh, people have uh, infinitely higher vi- viral load with the Delta variant, and they are shedding and transmitting uh up to a day or more sooner than with uh, the original variant. So um, even though I, I think the latest figure was, you know, 97 plus percent of hospitalizations are still uh, only, uh, you know, that that's still all the non-vaccinated people. We're seeing an increasing trend in fully vaccinated people that are testing positive. So, <clears throat> uh, right, right. Uh, in, uh, New, in New yeah. York, in New York, it's about I think uh, I, I said it earlier the vaccination rate in the state is about seventy something percent. In New York, it's about mid sixty percent. Uh, in this New York City, I should say mid sixty percent. I personally, 
am fully vaccinated. I wear my mask indoors. I don't wear my mask outdoors anymore. Um, right. But I do bring it with me, obviously, in a case that we, because uh, I, I live in you know New York City, if we do walk into an area that does have heavy foot traffic and there's a lot of people, then I will actually put it on even if I'm outside. It totally depends on the situation, but pretty much I still wear it almost all the time indoors, at least out places. Maybe in my apartment complex, I'll, I'll run downstairs without wearing it really fast if I need to grab right. something. But other than that, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, again, I know, uh, as said before, I, I know most people listening probably already know this stuff, but I, I can't can't emphasize it enough. No, um, I mean, there's probably someone, at the very least, uh, watching this show, for sure. No, and in general, obviously, there's a lot of people out there who just aren't. It's, it's ridiculous. You saw that story uh, about uh, the interview with a doctor in uh, Alabama who basically has patients come in dying from COVID and... They're begging to get the vaccine, and she tells them it's too late. Like it's amazing. Yeah. Like it's unbelievable. Yeah. And like, and the one one of the just real quick, and then then I should hop off in, in case you were taking that other call. But um, <clears throat> one thing that doesn't get mentioned that anyone who's had the misfortune of having to deal with it, or uh, anyone who uh, works inpatient in in the hospital. Uh, the unspoken tragedy or often unspoken tragedy that, that has been experienced throughout all this is not just uh, the people that go in with COVID and end up dying, uh, you know, often alone or at a distance with family or the ones that come out with, you know, chronic long-term issues from it. Um, but it's also all the people who have non COVID related severe problems and are in the hospital with terminal conditions or suddenly have a heart attack and w w any anything to where like you would really want your family there by your side not only to be with you for comfort but also to help make and guide your medical decisions and whatever uh infection rates uh hit a certain point and they have to clamp down on the visitor restrictions you know it's not like the grocery store the hospital takes it a lot more strictly and and they don't care whether people say they're vaccinated or not they're going to limit things and um <clears throat> it just it's uh, uh frankly it's it's terrifying terrifying and extremely depressing to even try to think about the number of people who uh, found themselves in medical emergencies and either, you know, never made it to the hospital uh, or died in the hospital alone without family or died because they didn't have family to communicate medical history if they weren't able to, um, people missing routine diagnostics, all that stuff. So, right. uh, but yeah, I, again, I get, I know it's it seems repetitive at this point, and it's yeah. something that we shouldn't have to communicate as much. But I just can't stress enough how much pain and suffering could be avo avoided by like minimal inconvenience to the common person. And that's part of what makes it so frustrating. Absolutely, I, I really appreciate the call uh, for both the uh, the crypto conversation and uh, for this uh, you know th th these reminders. I think it is important. I uh, hope, hope you call calling again uh, soon. Uh, it was a great call, and uh, keep me updated, actually, on how the Mount Gox thing goes. I'm sure you'll be finding out any minute. <laughs> yeah, once once I get my settlement, I'll start COVID coin, and then everyone can invest. <laughs> by the I hate to tell you, I hate to tell you this, but by the time you get that settlement, uh, COVID might be long forgotten, <laughs> like 40 years I'll, down the line. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pick another virus then. <laughs> All right, take her easy, man. Take care. Later. Hey, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, Matt. What's up? Hey. hey I'm, I'm Matei, calling from Slovenia again. Oh, hey. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. It's like 5.30 for me, but you know. Hey, well, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you calling in. What would you like to talk about? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. I can have a couple of topics. I don't know if you're bored of it, but I actually worked in a cryptocurrency startup for a year and a half. Oh. You can talk about something else if you want, though. Uh, you know, you've piqued my interest, buddy. Really quick. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I was just like, uh, I was just telling you, when I, when I ask me something, like... Yeah, what did the startup this... do? 
Oh yeah, we were doing like decentralized storage on Ethereum. I mean, they're still doing it. I'm just not part of the company anymore. What do you mean when you say decentralized storage, like um, like file storage, like like Dropbox? Yeah, yeah like uh, we have an app called uh, FairDrop, so it was similar to AirDrop, and basically to send files, you know, and you didn't even need, you know. Um, What's the crypto aspect? Oh, crypto aspect was the, um, um, I didn't actually want to talk about the project, I was just trying to talk about crypto in general, you know. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, I can talk about it, but you know, it, I don't want to be a shill here. And, no, but what was the, what's the crypto aspect of the file? Uh, pro, uh, uh, okay, so so there is a, on Ethereum, you know, when Ethereum started in like 2014, 2013, they had a file, uh, they had like a decentralized file system that's going to be built on top of it called Swarm. And they were like, I think uh, they're not part of Ethereum ecosystem anymore. I think they're launching their own network. Or, but basically, it's like if you wanna if you wanna send files, I mean not just files. You know, it's like if you wanna s break break a file into like small chunks and send it over. You know, similar to torrent, you can do it like over Swarm. And basically, like the whole idea was that you have a um, how could you call it? Uh, uh, a web hosting, you know, like basically instead of typing HTML, you know, it, you would have a browser that supports this network. It would be like BZZ slash and then just type an address, and that address is connected to like the Ethereum name service. So instead of typing, you know, the address of the Ethereum, um, like the hash number for the Ethereum address, you would just type in, I don't know madbinder.it and it would take you to a site and that site would be like you know you remember how internet was back in the 90s you know the site didn't remember anything about you right so i gotta say i gotta say you're losing me <laughs> yeah i don't know cause, cause that's why i wanted I, that's why i didn't want to talk about the project because it's i hear it's you. layers on top of it, it does seem like like these these projects like i don't really um like not, let's not spend any more time on this, but some of the, so many of these projects, like it seems like the crypto aspect is totally just like a marketing thing. Like what? Why does a file sharing program need a crypto aspect? Like if you're talking about like an encryption, like encryption or using like like sort of like, you know, uh, or, or technology that, you know, is used within some of these crypto uh, projects, then OK, I, I sort of get that. But I don't get what what the uh, the need for using like ethereum's uh you know platform for you know what i mean yeah like the whole point was like to to basically retain a file you know if you want to send it to somebody that would be basically free but if you want to put a file in the system and that it would actually stay there you would have to pay a fee you know like i don't know how much it was like i'd say one dollar or like whatever that was in it back then uh one dollar per month right. for every 10 gigabytes or something like that so let's let's hit one more topic and then i think i gotta take another call and then we gotta start wrapping up oh yeah now i just want to talk about renewables and like nuclear energy in europe because uh, right now there's like in slovenia they're planning on building a new power station and because we, we're gonna have to decommission the nuclear power plant and the old nuclear power station and there's like this huge debate because Germany and Austria, they're really against like nuclear power and they're trying to block the project. And it's like a Slovenian, I mean, uh, like the European investment bank, they don't, they don't, they don't, uh, Germany basically lobby there that investment in nuclear power is not, um, is not possible through like, they don't, they don't give loans to invest in nuclear. And like, I want to talk in general about how like Germany is basically building a second pipeline to Russia, and they're trying to force everybody to use renewables plus gas. Oh, I heard and about I heard about this. The uh, right, and uh, I heard about it from a very uh, you know U.S. centric take, where it's like, why is Biden allowing Russia to build this pipeline to Germany and 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 work with one of our allies? It's 
Yeah, so basically, like Germany, you know, 20 years ago, they decided they don't want to have nothing to do with nuclear, and they went pretty hard on renewables, particularly wind power. So, like, but the problem with wind power, you know, it's usually it's not like a steady source of electricity, so they have to complement it with something, and they plan to do it big on gas. So, they want to renew like solar plus wind plus gas should equal, you know lower CO2 emissions and they're kind of failing right now because like their energy prices are the highest in the world. I think they pay like 40 cents per kilowatt hour or something like that. And they're still pushing hard, you know, the pipeline is going to get approved. I mean, it is, it's going to start flowing gas, I think, at the end of the year. Uh, they're going to close all their remaining nuclear power stations in, in the end of the year, at least that's the plan. And I just wanted to know, you know, what's your opinion on like nuclear power versus renewables? I mean, I got to be honest. I don't I, I, I really have to look more into that specific aspect. I, I, I think um, in general, I have a negative opinion on nuclear power, being that I just think it is not good um, in terms of the implications of what could happen if uh, obviously something goes wrong. And I don't think it's, uh, you know, when, when we think about, uh, talk about clean energy and renewable energy, uh, I don't, nuclear power doesn't usually come to mind for me. Uh, but I know there are people who think nuclear power is an answer uh, to some of our issues and problems. I don't know if I would agree with that. But to be quite honest, I don't think I can authoritatively speak to that uh, right now off the cuff like this. Um, what I would probably do is I should probably get a guest or two on and um, we, could, we could talk about that and, and I could probably come back and give you my opinion on, on, on it at a later date. That would be more substantive, yeah. honestly. But I, as of right now, um, from what I know from just my reading, uh, not, not, not a good opinion on it. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know you, I know you don't have really time, but you know, I, I'm really, I'm like a nuclear energy nerd. You know, I like research all different type of nuclear reactor, like uh, solutions that are like. So basically, when when people talk about nuclear power, you know, usually they're building like third generation reactors right now. Here, like in let France. me actually, let me actually jump in. Zoe, Zoe said it much more. In, in, a, in a much better summary uh, for me than I think I uh, voiced it here on the show. Uh, Zoe said, nuclear is bad, but less bad than fossil. That's, that's yes. Um, I, I still think it's bad, obviously, which Zoe said, but it's clearly not uh, as bad uh, as fossil fuels. But, you know, it doesn't mean it's good. Uh, yeah. I think... Yeah. Uh, I, think I think I, you know... Uh, to, to more, you know, you definitely caught me uh, <laughs> uh, off guard here. But I, I want to say this. I, uh, I am not for nuclear uh, from what I know about it. And uh, I also think people who are arguing, uh, who do have uh, arguments for it, are not completely uh, off base when we think of the issue of fossil fuels. So I think um, in a perfect world, we would not have nuclear. Uh, power, but uh, I think um, if we need a middle ground uh, to get away from fossil fuels, uh, you know, I, I guess it, we should be somewhat open to it as long as we continue to work on uh, the better uh, the the better uh, options. Yeah, like um, here, especially in Europe, it's a it's a giant problem because France, you know, they don't really have any other energy, like. I mean, they could go all in renewables, but, you know, like they decided to go the nuclear way, like 80 percent of their power is from nuclear. And Germany, you know, they're, they're closing all their nuclear power stations and not building new ones. And it's kind of a really weird gridlock right now because, like, nothing's really going on. I mean, people people have still like there are some countries that are trying to build renewables and but uh, it's it's a really bad situation that's going on right now. No, I just wanted to say that. Right. right. 
I, I, there's I no, wanna, there's I no do, path forward. I do want to look more into this issue with this, uh, this pipeline you're talking about. So I appreciate you mentioning it because I was actually just reading about it earlier today. So uh, thanks for the call. Uh, yeah. Good morning over there. Have a, Listen, have a great day. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely get somebody uh, about renewables. More importantly, I mean, not, re not like, uh, how could I call it, N nuclear. So I had to say get somebody that does any research on like, four generation nuclear reactors, because this is like the thing that was built in the 60s, right? They just built it as a research, but they decided, you know, they, these reactors, they don't produce plutonium, so they're not really useful for the nuclear weapons industry. So we're not gonna build those reactors, but they built a bunch of research reactors and just as a proof of concept that they work. And right now, a lot of different startups and researchers all over the world, they wanna try to make those so, like those reactors uh, possible it's like i don't know at least 10 different types of reactors and it's like it's it's from like from russia and i think like bill gates and uh, warren buffett are going to try to convert a thermal like coal power plant into a nuclear power plant i think in montana or wyoming i forgot which one it was but it's definitely a lot going on and just like maybe get somebody that knows about this because it's a really interesting topic. Right, for sure. Thanks for the call. Uh, I have a few, yeah, people, few people in the chat mentioning nuclear waste and someone saying, where the Champagne Communista says, yeah, nuclear is useful as a transition, but very minimal. And then is your guy said nuclear would have been a good transition to renewables 40 years or so ago. Uh, and then we had another person point out, where is this? Uh, N.R. Gray says, 40 years ago, the tech was considerably worse and less efficient. So, yeah, I think it's an interesting conversation. Thanks for the call. Yeah, th thanks for having me. Have a great morning. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Bye, man. Bye. Uh, let's see what else. Um... <laughs> uh... All right, there's been someone trying to call in for a while. That'll be the last call. Call back in. I'll read a super chat. That's the last call, and then I'll do a story, and then that's that I wanted to do, and then that's it. Um, uh, where is this? Jess Garcia with a super chat. Interviewed for an art teacher position today. If I snag it, I'll sign up to be a patron. For now, here's five bucks. Oh, well, thank you, Jess. And uh, good luck on getting that position. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hello? Hello? That's weird. Didn't come through. Uh, Anastasia with a super chat. Have you ever had any interesting exchanges with Jimmy fans since covering the Boogaloo Boy interview? I mean, every now and then I'll get a at message from people saying, oh, you don't think we should talk to people who think differently? Or, oh, you don't think we should talk to the other side, you know, talk to right wingers? And I mean, clearly they've never listened to this show where I have obviously, obviously there's a phone uh, call system where anyone could call in and on the majority port too. Uh, I've spoken to many right wingers over the years. I'd love to do even more of that. I don't do enough of it. I would love to do even more of what I've already done. Uh, so no, that's not my issue with it. My issue was he had someone on and he didn't push back because he didn't know anything about them. He just basically gave them a platform to promote their right wing movement. Um, uh, but yeah, other than that, I haven't really heard from um, many of them, I guess. It's the same old one I do. Um, that guy, one of the guy, one of the co-hosts from Convo Couch wanted to have a debate with me about it because he also had that same argument and we were supposed to do it and we just haven't, I mean, I told him I'm down and he said he'd get back to me, uh, with this with the specifics and then I reached back out to him because I never heard back and he said he wanted to, you know, talk with me first, which is cool, but we just haven't like talked to me on the phone first, which is fine. I don't you know. I don't know why that's necessary, but if he would feel more comfortable doing that, that's fine. Um, but I've been ready to do it and uh, it's just not, it's just not happened yet. 
I'm ready to do it anytime, anywhere. Uh, well, anytime, anywhere. Uh, I work during the day, uh, uh, so I can't do it during the day. But any night, on any day, I would even do that debate as an episode of Doomed if he wanted to do it Thursday night. Um, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you name it, I'm ready to do it. It just hasn't happened yet. Um, I'd have it right now if he messaged me right now and said I wanted to do it now. Uh, Prairie Fire. Kowalski of the Super Chat. Interestingly, many nuclear plants in the United States are at a sea level and are vulnerable to climate change. Pentagon report said it is going to be a real problem by mid-century to the grid. That's another issue. Right. I didn't bring that up because it didn't come to mind. And Kowalski is just always on point. Also, I wanted to really thank you for your very personal story last week, Kowalski. Um, it's very powerful. And I appreciate you sharing that. Um, uh, Champagne Communista says you literally had Gun Girl on your show. Yeah, I got to upload that to YouTube. Unfortunately, there's no video because it was one of the earliest episodes of the show. And it was just when it was a podcast before I was also simultaneously live streaming. Uh, but I should still upload the audio to YouTube so people could find it. Bruce says, Pasta has some bad takes. That's what he goes by, right? Pasta. Um, he uh, just, I don't know what's going on. I don't want to say he's, you know, I'm not going to, I got to watch myself here. I'm not going to accuse anything going on here. I'm going to just assume it's just scheduling conflicts. But he came at me very strongly in public on Twitter not long ago. And I immediately reached out that day and said, let's do this. And we talked about doing it the following week. This is a couple of weeks back now. And uh, I never heard back from him, even though he was the one who was supposed to get back with, uh, to me with the logistics. And I reached back out and I said, what's going on? We're not doing this. And he said he wanted to have a uh, conversation with me first, like not public like not a live stream conversation which again don't know why it's necessary have no problem doing it um i've given him various times we could do it he was unavailable he gave me times he could do it those times didn't work for me this is just the phone call the the, the private phone call pre discussion pre public debate so i don't know what's going on i don't think you know i just want to do it let's just do it any night let's do it Ryan points out that um, the Gun Girl episode of Doomed was episode six, right? Um, wait, what's this? Where is this? Someone said something I wanted to read. Where did it go? Grim says, Fiorella from Convo Couch is all up in Medicare, uh, uh, the March for Medicare for All, but is actually opposed to socialized medicine. Amazing. This is one of the uh, stories I wanted to talk about today. <laughs> I came across this, uh, Grim, and I I was flabbergasted. I could not believe it. I I truly could not believe it. I'm closing the call system. Um, because no one else is called back in. Someone was calling in, they didn't call back in. Um, all right. I'm going to leave it open for one more second. I'll read a few more, uh, chats and then I'll close it. Ryan says that last call was hilarious today because Emma was not having it. Um, right, right, uh, the MRA caller, right, I felt bad taking that call, I didn't know, I don't know the story there, to be honest, oh, we got a call, 
Let's do it. Last call of the day. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, it's uh, it's Robert again. How are you doing? Hey, Robert. What would you like to talk about? Really, really like concise to the point. Quick conversation. Okay. Uh, issue that I have with people. Would you like transparency in government to see where the money is going? Yeah, sure. Okay, so why don't you like Bitcoin then? What? How is the two related? Okay, so a decentralized ledger in which everybody can see what's going on is the most equal accounting. If you've ever watched CoffeeZilla on YouTube, he's actually pretty big on the tech and Bitcoin side. Whenever people scam other people, he goes in, does research by finding the different accounts people have and tracking it back to different people. So quite literally, like, you can't lie. See, with, Well, like, I actually have spoken to CoffeeZilla uh, for a piece yeah. I wrote, so I'm very familiar with him. And I know that he uh, uses the blockchain for his investigations, which is uh, certainly, uh, you know, one of the positive aspects of uh, blockchain in terms of you're able to uh, mix reporting on crypto very easy when you're trying to... Uh, uh, out some scams, but here's the thing. The scammers are very stupid. The scammers who scam via crypto. Let me throw a wrench into your, um, your, your, uh, and obviously I'm sure uh, uh, CoffeeZilla would agree that this would throw a wrench into things because he himself has come across this, I'm sure. I know some ordinary gamers who he recently teamed up with to do the Face Clan investigation um, would agree with this aspect too. Um, I set up a new wallet to do my scams, and I never publicly share my wallet address. What then? Okay, if you want to transfer that money from any, if, if you've already had accounts where you've gotten, like, where you've pumped and you've dumped, right? So you've pumped, you've gotten, uh, uh, you started up a coin, got a bunch of public people invested, they all buy into it, then you dump. So that coin becomes worthless. They lose all their money. That money has to go somewhere. You right. have to send money with a specific wallet address to somewhere else. And you can track that. Right. And like but, coffee, not, but what coffeezilla, good. it takes a lot of exhaustive work. But how about this? When if there's some appointee in Wisconsin who spends $40,000 of a state, local, or federal budget on something he's not supposed to. You have to do a freedom of information request. And guess what? You have to sort through a whole bunch of that stuff, too. Like, the actual history of it was in 2009, dude, Bitcoin was like $0.001. It took over two-something years for it to finally reach one USD to one Bitcoin. Right, but so well, it, let's let's stick though to the argument you uh, you 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 are making though because we're going off topic already. Let's stick to the transparency in government angle of promoting of 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 pushing crypto. Um, I make a second wallet and send a little bit of money from the scammer wallet to the second wallet. Wait, what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, what you said always right where where I'm at. Okay, so I. Set up a second wallet, a third yeah. wallet, a fourth yeah. wallet, a fifth yeah. wallet. Never yeah. share any of those publicly. I send a little bit of money from the scammer wallet to those new wallets I set up. What then? I take money out of my bank account and I send it to one Western Union to somebody, another Western Union transaction to somebody else, another Western Union or MoneyGram to someone else. It's not the actual system that you're using. It's the fact that somebody is being devious and trying to hide money. It's like back in the day whenever the mob would take money. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not, listen, I'm not saying there's not other ways to scam. I'm saying the idea that cryptocurrency would solve transparency in government issues this is what you, you're failing to realize and why i went into the history of it when i talked about in 2009 mm -hmm. if you as a person like if you think anything can solve all problems that's foolish 
Bitcoin is not the solution to human depravity, indecency, or, you know, scammy behavior. Well, I'm it's glad just, I'm, I'm glad you realized that because I assure you a lot of Bitcoin uh, crypto advocates don't. <laughs> but I, but continue. No, it's what you have to understand, a bunch of people saw it as a get rich quick scheme because they didn't do their research. See, if you did actual research, if you if folks if you see what a lot of these scams, folks hype it up. They use their personality to hype it up and sell it with some type of promotional twist. Oh, of course. How? Like, so if, if I choose to, if somebody, there used to be an old scam back in the day where someone would literally sell you the deed to a bridge. Of right? course, yes. If you went down to the Hall of Records anywhere, you would know you can't buy the deed to a bridge. Like, you just can't. Right. So the ignorance of the people and them falling prey to this, to, to not doing research or reading. If, Matt, if I told you something that could be proven, and I said, look, Matt, trust me. Just don't believe your eyes. Don't go read in a, don't look online. Don't listen to CoffeeZilla. Just listen to me, right? Right. Then what have you done? Well, sh sh sure. Listen, but I, I think we're, we're we're really getting off here. Your argument again is that cryptocurrency will solve government transparency issues. I I I yeah. am I am laying it out to you that I agree that there are many ways to scam people that does not involve cryptocurrency. You are not you, but you. It's up to you to make the argument that cryptocurrency solves those. But your the argument you're making though is. Other things also fall victim to the same things cryptocurrency fall victim to. But that's not the original argument. The original argument is cryptocurrency solves those issues. Okay, so if you have, like, an act, because you know, for people who work with the government, you're supposed to use the government assigned email address that comes along with it. Right. You know, Hillary got in big trouble for having her own email right. server when she's supposed to use those systems. If you use the email addresses, the informational stuff that is based on, like, like your, your department, whatever it is that's generated, if you try to take that money from that system, you have to send it somewhere. If the, gover if the property that you use it on is like government property. You log in, it tracks wait, all I'm, your I'm, logs. I'm, 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 I'm lost. I'm sorry. Wait, wait how do we go from <laughs> Hillary's emails to cryptocurrency? I'm, let's, let's, let's reset no, no, here. No, no. no, literally, like, dude, Hillary Clinton was using emails, right? Right. From her own per personal server, right? Yep. She, as the Secretary of the State, she was supposed to use the email servers that the government provided. Absolutely. That was linked a government email address, right? Absolutely. So if you have a government email address, the government system, all of that set up, and you use that to create a particular wallet that is linked to the government, that means that you have to go through that governmental body to start trying to move stuff around. You have to go onto it with a government-issued laptop that has a call number, uh, a certain address, and if you try to log into that account, that wallet, through something else that is outside of that purview, they can track that. Right, but no one's saying to – I mean, plenty of crime is committed through, <laughs> through the official government channels. Let's say that scenario, your scenario, as I'm understanding it, is every wallet that would be held by a government official would be attached to their official email account and – be recorded yeah. on all their devices sure they could just send the holdings in their wallet to whatever wallet is not connected to those official uh transactions and just say we were contracting to an organization or a company uh that we needed to contract with to get a specific job done and then the money could be laundered from there and th okay so if any transactions that go through it you have to file a wallet address. 
like literally. I mean, companies already do have to file. Uh, you know, we already do have public information as to what companies get government contracts and where government money goes in terms of uh, businesses and contractors and things like that. These are all things you could find out. Uh, a lot of these are actually done publicly because the bidding system is public. Um, yes. So everything online. Right, right. You could find out a lot of these things. Uh, also, um, you know, if we're even talking campaign stuff, if we're talking about like, oh, we're worried about, uh, you know, because they're not officially government officials yet, but they're running to be. I mean, a lot of these financial details are also available online. Campaigns have to put out uh, FEC filings and you can actually find out uh, the names of specific people who donated. I believe the amount is over 200 if you donate over two hundred dollars, your information is public. Because obviously, if you're donating under two hundred, uh, you know it's small amounts of money. You're not really. Uh, but I also think there are some systems that do uh, track all donations. I have to uh, uh, figure out. Ex I have to come back with you to you about exactly what those are. But the law definitely states that uh, over two hundred uh, is certainly uh, filed. Um, so, I mean, a lot of this stuff is known. It really, a lot of this stuff is known. Um, I, I don't know what crypto would do to solve that. Uh, and just breaking payments down, breaking payments down into small amounts and making certain that the work that is done is logged digitally. And for after, basically, let's say we break up the work into five pieces. So you have to complete 20% for you to receive another 20% of the payment. And the digital proof of that work, be it um, showing a certain amount of the code is done, be it showing a certain amount of the road has been laid, like, you know, the components for that, making that all available digitally as right. well. But you don't, need, you don't need the blockchain or cryptocurrency to do that. I mean, there are plenty of, uh, like, project management systems out there that do keep track of where these things are. I mean, if you're saying this stuff should be uh, all publicly available information, I completely agree with you. Uh, and if you think blockchain is the way to go about this, then uh, certainly you could make that um, argument. But I fail to see how uh, cryptocurrency or the blockchain solves current issues. Uh, I, I don't see it at all. Uh, you know, if you're if you're talking about new things, like you want uh, a digital system to see how far along government projects are. Then I mean, yeah, that's something completely different, though. That's not a you know, that's not something that's currently, uh, as far as I know, uh, well, I mean, implemented. It could be used for continuous citizen engagement. Right. Your 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 call is not kind of going. There's a lot of background noise, and I sort of got to jump now. But I appreciate the call. Thank you for calling in. All right, good. Bloop bloop. You know, I gave everyone lots of time. Uh. Obviously, that first caller got the bulk of it because he was the first caller, and that's just how the conversations went. But I'm looking at the times now. Everyone got over 10 minutes of airtime, which is way more than you would get on a radio show or uh, any other live stream, if you ask me. Um, let me read some Super Chats. Oh, I should get to the stories because we can always get to the Super Chats after. All right, let me do this because I really wanted to talk about this. I'm, I, I don't know if I can do this now. Three hours in. Jeez, I did it again. A three-hour show. But let me do this. All right. <clears throat> I'm, I, God, I should have done this up top, shouldn't I? All right, so. <sighs> <laughs> Ooh, let me actually get everything ready here. Whoops, hold on, not, that's not what I want. Let me get everything I need. Oh, that's not what I want to get. Let me get everything I need ready here. I hope I don't get a copyright claim for that. Oh, oh no, I'm I'm spoiling it, spoiling it. Oh, oh, spoiler, spoiler. All right, everything's ready now. All right, so was it yesterday? No, it was all right. So Wednesday night. I, I don't even know if I should uh date this because I, I no, I gotta cut this and get it up ASAP tomorrow. But here we go. This is this is the fun topic I'm talking about. 
So, so Wednesday night I'm on Twitter and all of a sudden I see this crazy claim that I've never heard before start spreading around. This rumor has never gone anywhere before. I've never heard any of this ever through the grapevine before just a few nights ago. It just seemingly came out of thin air all of a sudden. And it was this tweet. Uh, The first place I saw it was this tweet by a YouTuber named Jackson Hinkle. Is that his name? Hinkle. Yes, Jackson Hinkle. And I'm honestly not that familiar with him. According to a lot of people, he has been feuding with TYT recently. I know nothing about this. I have no interest in these online feuds. i clueless completely. Never even heard of this guy. Maybe I think I saw his name come up because there was this Vosh debate he did going around. I didn't watch it, but uh, I saw that going around. So I have this tweet from Jackson Hinkle that was going viral just a few nights ago. Uh, Here it is. AOC co-owned the restaurant she used to bartend at, and she worked on a foreign affairs issues for Senator Ted Kennedy before running for Congress. Uh, Justice Dem strategist told AOC not to talk about either occupation during her campaign and to instead claim she was just a bartender. And then he has a screenshot of an article saying Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was working behind a bar. She had helped launch Flats Fix, the taco and craft cocktail spot in Manhattan, while pondering what to do next. Now, here we go. Let's get to this right away. So I forgot to grab the tweet. Let me see if I can find it really quick. But uh, let me take the most obvious claim that we could debunk. Uh, up for, let me take that one first. And that is her time working for uh, Senator uh, Ted Kennedy. And this is true. Uh, This is true. Uh, AOC did work for Senator Ted Kennedy. Uh, But here's the thing. Um, This was not some sort of secret. Uh, I could do a screen share right now, actually. Let me do that really quick. Uh, Where is this? Okay. Here we go. Let's do a screen share really fast. I quickly searched uh, AOC's uh, Twitter handle on Twitter. And typed in Kennedy. And what came up is these tweets. Uh, One from December 2017. Fun fact about U.S. immigration policy from my experience working with Ted Kennedy. Uh, uh, Another one uh, from February of 2018. Uh, I have a degree in economics and other international relations from Boston University. Before that, MIT honored my work in microbiology. I started under Ted Kennedy... Uh, here's another one. Uh, May 2018. After 10 years, about 10 years ago, I worked for Ted, Ke- and about 10 years ago, I worked in Ted Kennedy's foreign affairs, immigration, and constitu- constituent office. I regularly fielded calls from panicked mothers who came home to missing family members. ICE was created in 2003, along with the Patriot Act. There was a weapon waiting for a tyrant. Um, I mean, uh, here's another one. August 2018. Uh, As an intern, I learned a lot about the power of humanity and government through his, uh, you know, with uh, with Ted Kennedy. Uh, She's talking about McCain there. Uh, I mean, uh, twenty June twenty nineteen. I also I am always proud of my work in restaurants. I also worked for Senator Ted Kennedy. Uh, I mean, really. uh, Here's another one. February twenty twenty. I'm a former multi year intern for Senator Ted Kennedy. I mean. Uh, Big shocker, uh, she interned for Senator Ted Kennedy. She was a college student in Massachusetts. Uh, He was a, uh, you could certainly uh, criticize and critique many aspects about Ted Kennedy's career, Uh, but he certainly was seen as an early uh, progressive icon, and she interned for him. Uh, Oh my God, big revelation you could have uncovered by typing in the Twitter search bar from AOC, Kennedy. Uh, Now, back to the claims that, uh, the other claim that uh, Hinkle uh, makes here. And this is, and I should be fair, these are claims he's sharing. Uh, He is claiming that uh, he learned about this from people. Uh, AOC co-owned the restaurant she used to bartend at, and she worked on foreign affairs issues for Senator Ted Kennedy before running for Congress. Okay, but the, the, the restaurant one's what I'm focusing on now. 
here is uh, the info there. I looked into this uh, that night, Wednesday night, and I uh, looked into this issue because I had never heard that she co-owned the bar. Flats Fix is a known uh, taco bar uh, in Union Square, Manhattan. I'm very familiar with it. In fact, I've been there before. Uh, I used to work very close by to that place. It is connected to a famous Union Square coffee shop called, uh, people in New York, some people call it Coffee Bar. It's Coffee Shop. Uh, and it's a long-time fixture, even though Coffee Bar closed in uh, 2018, I believe. But the taco bar is still there. And the owners of the coffee shop also own the taco bar. Flats Fix, where AOC worked. And they also own a number of other restaurants throughout the city. There's one that's very famous, uh, if you're a New Yorker at least, Live Bait, which also recently closed after becoming the second location for Flats Fix. So that didn't work out. But the original Flats Fix, the one AOC worked at, is still open. Now, if you look up these restaurants, they're very well known. There's been numerous press uh, 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 coverage on these restaurants over a long course of time. Because again, fixtures in New York. Uh, the coffee shop is owned by three people. Uh, one of the companies attached to it is called Theme, uh, what was it? Uh, theme Bar or something like that. Theme Foods, that's it, Theme Foods. Theme Food, I should say. And this is a company that's been around for decades. Uh, Live Bait was opened in 87, three years before, two years before AOC was born. Uh, coffee bar was opened up in uh, 89 or 90, I believe, which would be a year after AOC was born. Uh, obviously, the taco place opened up much after. Uh, AOC obviously was old enough to work there. Uh, but I've never come across anything claiming AOC co-owned the bar. Uh, and so I shared all this information. I shared the liquor license information where, uh, again, AOC is not attached. But, of course, not all the owners are attached to the liquor license information. But, uh, again, the, the same three people who've owned all these restaurants for decades comes up. Uh, Dave Weigel of the Washington Post went a step further the next morning because he saw this same claim going around. And uh, he uh, got a pretty uh, hardcore... Uh, sh open shut case proof that this claim is bullshit because he went ahead and he called the restaurant and the staff confirmed that uh, Ocasio-Cortez <coughs> never owned or co-owned the restaurant obviously because again this is all public information uh, and also as he points out this information could be confirmed by her 2018 financial declaration which all candidates need to file and we could see how much AOC actually uh, made. Uh, let me make it a little bit smaller and center it. Uh, right there, her coffee shop wages uh, that year was $3,588 earned income. Her salary uh, was more because she was taking money from the Ocasio-Cortez campaign, which candidates are allowed to do. So... Uh, we know her financial details. We know from decades of press coverage of these restaurants. Uh, we also had a hit piece in the New York Post uh, a couple of years ago where uh, a worker who did not like AOC claimed that uh, the, a manager there had to give her uh, extra tips because she claimed AOC didn't split her tips fairly enough. Uh, again, if you own a restaurant... Uh, you're not going to be uh, overruled by another manager and you certainly wouldn't be handling out your own bar tips. Uh, just really uh, bizarre. But see, I don't really care about uh, Hinkle. Uh, what I care about is where he heard this claim. I mean, Hinkle is just some random YouTuber. He's not even like a known YouTuber. He's not like a big, has some big fan base or something. He's just a nobody. Uh, not to, again, not to knock him. It's just like, I care about the big picture here. And Hinkle is not the big picture, even though he's the source of this information going viral. So I looked further into this, and uh, where did Hinkle say he heard this from? Because again, uh, this Hinkle isn't the direct source. 
Uh, he goes on to say, Paula Jean Swearingen just confirmed that AOC was a co-owner of the restaurant on a live stream. Uh, and I have multiple Justice Democrat con contacts who have communicated this to me in the past as well. Now, that last part, I don't believe. Uh, because, uh, full disclosure, I have worked with the Justice Democrats before. And I have never heard this. And as both a journalist and someone who has worked with them prior, uh, uh, it was freelance basis, you know, but I, I'm familiar with a number of people there. Uh, I've worked with them on campaigns when I worked for the Cynthia campaign. Um, I was shocked that this would come from that, and I don't believe it. Uh, so I'm pretty sure he's referring to Paula Jean Swearingen that second time around, because that's what he says he heard it from. Paula Jean Swearingen just confirmed that AOC was a co-owner of the restaurant on a live stream. What live stream? What live stream? What live stream was he talking about? I, 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 now, now, Paula Jean Swearingen was on a live stream that night. Uh, luckily, she was only on one live stream. So it makes it really easy to know what live stream uh, Hinkle was talking about. Uh, and so I searched more on Twitter. And I noticed that everybody else who was also sharing this, these rumors, these unsubstantiated rumors about AOC owning the bar she worked at. And I remember why this is a big deal to them. The idea is AOC lied about her history in order to appeal to voters, to progressives, as some sort of champion of the working class because she too was part of the working class. She was a worker who a blue collar worker working uh, behind a bar. If she was a co-owner of the bar, that totally changes the dynamic of her story. And obviously she would have lied about her story, right? Uh, so where did this, this unsubstantiated rumor come from? From uh, a user who also found out about this rumor from the same source as uh, Kinkle. Paula Jean Swearingen said this on Jimmy Dore's stream earlier. Hmm. 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 Shocking that this would start from the Jimmy Dore show. And by shocking, I mean not surprising at all. Now, Jimmy Dore locks up his live streams right after the live stream ends. And to get this live stream, you have to be a paying subscriber of the program, which is cool. Yeah, I don't, no problem with that. I, I mean, I think it's a bit weird that you wouldn't at least make portions of these interviews public. I know he does cut segments, but he also leaves a lot uh, locked behind that paywall. Um, but, you know, that's his prerogative. Uh, it's his show. Uh, it's his way of making money. That's fine. Uh, but I was really interested in seeing this Paula Jean Swearingen clip. I, I, because to me, it's important here. Jimmy Dore has Paula Jean Swearingen on his show, and she apparently says this. Um, now, it's his show. He didn't say it. I want to be clear. Jimmy Dore did not say this. But it started, this unsubstantiated rumor, this, what we now know is a falsehood, was said on his show, the Jimmy Dore show. I know on my show, and on any other program, even Jimmy Dore's fans, if they heard a lie about someone they supported, or just a lie in general about uh, a cause or anything of the sort, on MSNBC, CNN, whatever, TYT, Young Turks, Majority Report, whatever it is, you would want that falsehood corrected, right? And you would expect someone to correct that if it was their show. Or at least stop and question where they got this information from. So to me, it was imperative I find out what Jimmy Dore says before and after Paula Jean allegedly states this. Now, to do this, I needed to subscribe to Jimmy Dore show. I'm not going to do that. But I have uh, uh, people who are fans of my show and the Majority Port who apparently do have access to Jimmy Dore's uh, paid subscription feed. And so I have for you, I have not seen this anywhere else, I have for you this Paula Jean Swearingen clip. We are going to watch it right now. We're going to hear what question brings forth this alleged falsehood. Oh, this alleged, um, uh, the falsehood is true. It's, oh, it is true that this falsehood was stated, but allegedly Paula Jean says it. So we're going to find out where this uh, falsehood came from 
And what Jimmy Dore says right after it's stated. Let's listen to this clip right now. And so just in closing, uh, what, what do you think happened to the Justice Democrats? Why do you think they don't strategize and vote as a block like the Tea Party did? Because they have all the power. They can block any bill and every bill if they wanted to get their demands met, yet they won't do it. Why what? What? What is 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 uh is door serious right now? Um this isn't even what I'm uh <laughs> what I'm even discussing here, but what what what? The tea party was quite large. Is door alleging that the Justice Democrats numbers are enough to block I mean, let me look this up. Let's find out right now. I'll do this live right now here on the show. No, that's not true. <laughs> uh, if every... Uh, Justice Democrat, there is, I believe, 10 of them right now, uh, voted against the Democratic Party. Uh, Republicans still have enough. As of right now, obviously, this could change due to vacancies. But as of right now, that's not true. Justice Democrats don't have the numbers the Tea Party had. Yet. But that's not the point of this. Let's continue. What do you think that is? I say it's because they're corrupt, because they're, they get the speaking fees, they got book deals, they don't want Nancy Pelosi to fund somebody who's going to primary them, and then in five, all they have to do is stay five years and they get retirement for their life, they get a pension for the rest of their life. So they're doing this for their own person. So that's corrupt. That's the definition of corrupt, in fact, that they're well, being dishonest for their own personal gain. Is that what you think happened? I think it is personal gain. For those of you who don't know, Paula Jean Swearingen, is a twenty uh, is a is a twenty eighteen primary candidate. She primaried Joe Manchin for Senate in twenty eighteen. She was covered in that Netflix documentary along with AOC. Uh, Bernie Sanders supported her. Uh, she was a progress. She's a progressive uh, in West Virginia. She ran again in twenty twenty. This time, as the Democratic candidate against the Republican senator, she lost that too. Um, I always uh, assumed that. Um, uh, you know, uh, Swearingen had some good politics from what I've understood about her. Uh, she came out, the reason Jimmy Dore had her on the show is because she came out and said she was leaving the Democratic Party to join a third party, the People's Party. That's a whole nother segment, a whole nother episode. People's Party has a array of issues and problems. Also, I don't think they're even that progressive. Uh, but that aside, that's who Paula Jean Swearingen is. That's why she's on the Jimmy Dore show. Let's get to it. I sure got to, to, to party and uh, Corp and Trent were trying to formulate another pack and let's get another AOC elected in West yeah. Virginia. And I wouldn't support that. I think they just follow the money and they follow the buzz. And it really wasn't intended to elect real public servants. I, you know, I think that AOC is friends with those folks way back. And I think they used us to make sure that AOC got elected. Even before, you know, they were pulling out of our campaigns. They promised all these services. And right toward the end, before AOC's primary, they were taking everything away from us and they were vesting everything in her. And I think the first intent was to get AOC elected. And to be honest with you, I don't think the Democratic Party would have let her through the gate. I'm sorry. I need to. I need to. I, I need to. I mean, this is a. Someone who's run two campaign, a candidate, two time candidate, ma major na like Senate runs, doesn't understand how can these campaigns work. Justice Democrats don't have unlimited resources. The reason you would pull out of supporting some of the campaigns that you endorsed and put all resources into one campaign towards the very end, like Paula Jean Swearingen just said, is because the other campaigns 
are flailing the writings on the wall. And it would be a waste of your resources to spend the money on a campaign that is doomed. A campaign that is not going to win at this point, no matter what resources you pump into it. So you take those resources and you take them out of the wasteful campaign and you put it all into the campaign that you're seeing, oh my God, we have a chance to win this one, which clearly they did and clearly they were right. I am, Let me pull this up right now. Paula Jean Swearingen in the 2018 election, she was a primary candidate against Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin won that with a hundred with over one hundred and twelve thousand votes, nearly seventy percent or sixty nine point nine percent of the vote. Paula Jean Swearingen got a point one percentage over thirty percent and less than fifty thousand votes. All the money in the world at that point wasn't going to save the campaign. If it was a close race, if you guys were just a few percentage points away from each other, I would understand being upset about this. But that's not what happened. They took the money from your campaign and the resources and the time and the whatever else they were putting into it, and they saw AOC was about to beat Joe Crowley, and they put it all into that, and guess what? It paid off because AOC beat Joe Crowley. It's that simple. She pretended to be an ordinary person. She pretended to be a bartender when she was co-owner of the bar. Oh, knew- there we have it. There we have it. Let me rewind it a little bit. There it is. Party would have let her through the gate. There it is. She pretended to be an ordinary person. She pretended to be a bartender when she was co-owner of the bar. She never told us that she worked for the Kennedys. She mentioned the Kennedys thing multiple times on her Twitter feed. Stepping back to 2017. The year before her election was even happened in that June, June of 2018. This is just astounding. And I would love to know where she got this cologne the bar thing from. Her mother in an interview said that she wanted to be pre- pre- you know, president one day. Kids say that all the time. And that's the pa- it's parents' job to say, oh, I remember. That's what it happens. Kids say that all the time. If you're a kid and you say you want to be president one day, does that mean you're an insider and you have some sort of connections? This is ridiculous. Are you kidding me? She had decided she wanted in politics and she laid the framework of acting like she was one of us. When you had real struggling people, not only the candidates, but people behind the scenes, We saw she was making less than $30,000 for the year she filed when she was running as a candidate. Living in New York City. Less than $30,000. Are you kidding me? She wasn't really struggling? What? I'm just, I'm I'm really... uh... I really believed that we could get real public servants elected. And then now she's just doing what she lied about. I think she lied to get there. And I, I'm i disappointed. I'm very disappointed. But now I think we have suffered a lot of losses in this movement. I'm stubborn, but I'm also a mother and grandmother. I cut my leg off for my I'm kids. Assuming, I'm not done. I'm assuming I'm Jimmy Dore is going to butt in But soon. I'm not going to invest right? in people anymore. And ask for that some are, that more information, right? Do About some all good those claims she just made, right? And making sure Let's that we have a government says. that serves us. It's show, right? And it's going to take an overhaul, and it's going to take a new national party. Here we go. And I hope everybody listens to what I'm saying. I've been there. I've been into the internal grind work, and I know how dishonest these people are. Mm-hmm. It's beat me down, but it's going to pick me back up, and nobody should feel be down right now. We can, excuse me, a nap. We can, we can build a new party, and we can build a government that serves us, and we can get actual people servants elected. Mm-hmm. But we've got to quit getting put everything behind these moment, dishonest here? people and fighting people that are designed to fight us. Well, 62% of Americans are in favor of a third party. That's unbelievable. And <laughs> that's, that's what he takes away from this. The interview ends right there. That's it. He says goodbye to her. This is, this is stunning. Stunning. All those claims just made, and he doesn't even for a second say to himself, whoa, this is, even as someone who I know he doesn't like AOC, you think even those claims would 
light a fire in you to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I really, you know, in his brain going, oh, I don't like AOC and I haven't heard this. Whoa, whoa, Paula Jean, wait a second. She owned the bar that she claimed she worked at? You got to tell me more about this. I've never heard anything about this before. Nothing. 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 And I don't know about his claim there that 62% of Americans want a third party. Maybe it's true. I don't know. I'm not against the third party. Um, the current system currently makes it very difficult, but um, I'm uh, not opposed to it, but that's besides the fact. This is truly stunning. And, uh, you know, after all this came out, Hinkle, who really made this claim go viral, uh, came out with a sort of retraction. A tweet of mine repeated a claim from sources at the Justice Dems, including a former JD candidate. I want to tell you right now, remember how I said before that I didn't believe he had Justice Democrat uh, sources and that he heard it solely from Paula Jean Swearingen while listening to the Jimmy Dore show? Um, I can tell you that um, this really affirms my beliefs. Because when he says, a tweet of mine repeated a claim from sources at the Justice Dems, including a former JD candidate. By saying including, I mean, I think he means solely a former JD candidate. And when he says a former JD candidate, he's rever referring to Paula Jean Swearingen. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Uh, so a tweet of mine repeated a claim from sources at the Justice Democrats, including a former Justice Democratic candidate, that AOC co-owned the bar she worked at in New York. This statement has been disputed. No, it hasn't been just disputed. It's been outright debunked. But the statement has been disputed, leading me to remove the tweet until there is documentary evidence beyond my sources to prove it. Uh, well, there's never going to be any uh, documentary evidence because uh, apparently you don't trust your sources which means you shouldn't have shared any of the bullshit you shared to begin with uh, because it created an entire firestorm online of people sharing this bullshit over and over. I just saw it going around and I still people sh see people sharing it because, of course, once it gets out there, no one ever reads the retraction or the correction when it comes to these bullshit, unsubstantiated conspiracy theories and falsehoods and misinformation. You already did the damage. Really stunning. Really stunning. And um, I should say, uh, I was, uh, where is this? I was uh, on, <laughs> someone told me that uh, I was on Rising this morning. And I was like, what? I was not on Rising this morning. I, was, I did not do an interview with Rising this morning. Uh, but apparently, I was talked about. A YouTuber took down a viral tweet yesterday claiming that Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez co-owned the bar she worked at in New York. Despite it being obviously false, the story continued to spread. This is Ryan Grimm. Journalist Matt Biner replied no, to the initial no, claim. No, no, Ryan Grimm, no! It's Binder! Obviously not false, Binder. the story continued to spread. Journalist Matt Biner replied ah, to the initial claim, saying, quote, the bar the was shadow. owned by three people who run a company called Theme Food Inc. He even pulled up the liquor license for the bar, Flats Fix, which shows Theme Food, the company that owns the bar, was founded in 1986, three years before AOC was born. Washington Post reporter Dave Weigel even called the bar to confirm that it was untrue. This is an interesting story, not because it's worth fact-checking it, because it's not. You know, journalists can't be tasked with fact-checking every random claim that's, that's made on Twitter. And it's also not interesting to just dunk on a YouTuber, a person who, who happened to make a claim. People make false claims all the time. Yeah. What's, what's so interesting here is the legs that, that this claim got. Right. Like the fact that, the, that a Washington Post reporter and Matt Binder are, like, are actually digging in Did and debunking again. this. And Sorry. also that it won't matter. Like, I suspect that over the next year or so, you will... Right. I, I wanted to play that clip, not just to point out that I was uh, both referred to on Rising by Ryan Grimm and uh, he messed up my last name. But uh, no, but the reason is because I agree with that. But I think that's just one of the main issues. To me, the reason I'm covering this is not to dunk on Hinkle, of course, because, I mean, again, who is he? There's a nobody in the big picture. But his viral, his claim did go viral, and it, it meant you had to refute it. You had to debunk it. 
because it was a false claim. But also what's important to me and why I covered it and why the bulk of my this segment was on door is because that's the important part. Where is this stuff coming from? And why is it that time and time again, when a certain subsection of this left that's susceptible to these falsehoods and these random uh, through the grapevine rumors and conspiracy theories, why is so much of that stuff funneled to them by the Jimmy Dore show? I mean, I just, it just, I want to really understand what's going on here. Because it is super uh, problematic. We're getting to a re- it's getting to be a real issue. That there seems to be one show that is accounting for a large swath of what an entire subsection of the left is pushing when it comes to false information. Um, and let me get to this because one of the big reasons people are hating on AOC right now is because she apparently won't appear or promote that big, uh, well, let me reset because I don't know if I should call it big, but I also don't want to dunk on it by retracting that. So let me just reset. One of the, (laughs) one of the reasons why there is so much anti-AOC sentiment coming out right now from a certain subsection of the left, especially the left that is fans of the Jimmy Dore show and were proponents of the force to vote strategy is because they are upset that AOC is not promoting or showing up to this Medicare for All. I believe it's called the March for Medicare for All Uh, event that's happening in 40 some odd cities across the country this Saturday. And I discussed the March for Medicare for All on this program before. I did a segment, you could find it on the podcast, on the live stream, and I also cut it out as a standalone segment on YouTube. And my discussion of it was one, to point out this complete fuck up where they somehow let someone or had someone or someone found their way into the social media or the Slack messaging system of the organization and were able to get the organization to share that Matthew Heimbeck, a neo-Nazi, was going to be a, uh, a highlighted speaker at one of these March for Medicare for All events. And a lot of these people didn't know who Matthew Heimbeck was. The shit was promoted. It was a bad look. And the second was I did want to say I would never knock people for organizing. And so I was uh, down on those who were using this Matthew Heimbeck uh, catastrophe uh, to dunk on these people. Because I, listen, I'm not going to do that. Again, these are people who uh, feel very strongly about Medicare for All. I do as well. I just... Uh, disagree with sh- different strategies they uh, are for, uh, or not even just disagree with the strategies. I just don't think the strategies are this strategy and this strategy and nothing else. I think those are strategies that should be considered, and there should be a number of forms of direct action and electoral strategies, and they just don't think that way, apparently. Which is fine. But I'm, I'm not going to dunk on people who are trying to get out there and do something. And I, I, that's been my position. I've not dunked on them. I did point out that these people often refuse to understand what people like me say about the far right. The, and, you know, for example, they are all for reaching out to the Boogaloos, mostly because Jimmy Dore did. Um, and they've been urging for this sort of uh, left-right, red-brown alliance. Terrible idea. Horrible strategy this blindness to what the right is for and that we're not going to have this come together kumbaya movement is what leads to things like the Matthew Heimbeck being announced as a speaker for the Medicare for All thing and no one immediately shutting that down. Um, But that was my issue with it. 
not the fact that they're out there and uh, trying to do something. Good for them. If you're into what they're doing, check out their event on Saturday. But this AOC, anti-AOC sentiment is coming from a lot of the people who are in that world. And I came across this tweet from one of the Convo Couch people. I mentioned the Convo Couch before. Uh, one of the co-hosts on there, Pasta, has been wanting to debate me about uh, the Boogaloo Boys and reaching out to the right. Uh, he came out me hard on Twitter. I came back at him just as hard. I love that type of stuff. I don't care. I take nothing personally. I immediately DM'd him and said, let's do this debate. It hasn't happened yet. Don't know why. I'm working on it. I, uh, As far as I know, he still wants it to happen. I'm going to do everything I can to make it happen. But his co-host on Combo Couch is a uh, young woman by the name of uh, Fiora Fiorella, excuse me, Isabel. Now, again, I'm not too familiar with Convo Couch. I've come across them every now and then. I know they are part of this sort of uh, uh, Jimmy Dore left. And by Jimmy Dore left, I mean they often align with everything uh, Jimmy Dore is saying, where it's this, uh, you know, forced to vote. Uh, they align with him on this strategy of basically burning down uh, any sort of progressive that gets... Uh, uh, elected to office when they don't immediately uh, change everything all by their lonesome. Um, and listen, I'm all for criticizing elected officials. I do it all the time. I just think this criticism needs to be based in reality. And when I saw this criticism from Fiorella of Convo Couch, I immediately saw a criticism not only not based in reality, but one that is just so completely out there that it literally flies in the face of common sense. So for those of you who don't know, Nina Turner, one of Bernie Sanders' biggest, in my opinion, most effective advocates uh, for her, both his 2016 and 2020 election, has become this progressive firebrand. I think she is fantastic. Has she... Uh, oh, always been uh, you know, on top of everything perfectly and always, you know... Uh, 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 spoken uh, to things in, in ways that I would agree with. No, I don't, again, I criticize people all the time. But I think she is an example of someone who's legit. I mean, she never, she, she was a Hillary supporter in 2016, early on. And then someone told her about Bernie before Bernie blew up, and she immediately knew this was the guy for her. And she stuck with him. She isn't someone who found someone else for 2020 when the field was much wider. She was 100% on board with Bernie. She's never changed her policy positions. Uh, I'm happy that she did seem to change her positions on electoral politics. That's one of the areas I disagree with her on that I was referencing. Uh, I didn't agree with her uh, 2016 comments on how to vote. Uh, I did agree with her 2020 comments. Uh, 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 not fully, but much more closely aligned. Uh, I think she's great, though. And she is running in a special election in Ohio. Uh, I believe it's uh, Ohio's 11th district includes the city of Cleveland. It's a very important special election. Uh, the establishment, the Democratic Party, is doing everything to make sure she loses. Uh, the race is extremely tight. The uh, uh, election is, I believe, Tuesday, August 3rd. Let me double check that. Yes, Tuesday, August 3rd. It is imperative if you are a progressive that we get one more person in there who is a staunch, hardcore fighter for Medicare for all and various other progressive policy ideals. Um, and this Saturday, July 24th, she is teaming up with AOC. AOC is going out to Ohio. And Nina Turner and AOC are going to, they call it a Cleveland Day of Action, AOC for Nina Turner, join AOC to knock doors for Nina on Saturday, July 24th. Nina tweeted out, hello, somebody. That's her catchphrase. I love it. Join at AOC and me on July 24th to meet with Ohio voters about the issues that matter most. Together, we are going to build a country where everyone can thrive no matter their zip code. Sign up with the link below and help us get out the vote. Extremely important uh, get out the vote uh, event for Nina Turner's campaign. Fiorella saw this, Fiorella of Convo Couch, and this is her take. 
Funny how AOC and Turner decide to meet up on a day. There's a 46 city march for Medicare for all. You know what they've you know what they've campaigned on. What working people gave AOC money for and what she's donned on her masks and merch but didn't lift a damn finger to fight for and interest and instead gave money to police. There's a lot to unpack here, but for the purpose of this segment, let's focus on this ridiculousness about there being some sort of conspiracy about the date this was planned for. The reason Nina Turner and AOC are hosting an event in Cleveland to knock on doors for Nina Turner's campaign on July 24th, which just happens to be the same day as this Medicare for All March, is one. It's 10 days out from her election. 10 days out from her election. Do you understand how important the weekends especially are? This is the second to last Saturday they've got. This is a hugely important time frame. We are, the, the clock is ticking. We are at the tail end of an important campaign, they got to get out the vote and campaign with everything they've got now. This is absurd. And let's just say, you know, why not go to the Cleveland Medicare for All March? Well, for one, they'd be speaking to the choir, right? These are people who effectively should be for Nina Turner. Uh, if anything, they should be out there helping get out the vote for her, knocking on doors. If they want Medicare for all, she's someone, it's part of her party platform. It's part of her campaign platform. You can look it up on her website. She specifically mentions Medicare for all. She's a hardcore Medicare for all advocate. She's a fighter for Medicare for all. You want Medicare for all? You get Nina Turner in there. You up those Justice Democrat numbers. Hey, we got Nina Turner in there. Jimmy Dore said earlier that the Justice Democrats could vote in a block, right? Uh, and block Democratic uh, bills if they don't get what they want, right? Well, I just looked it up and they actually can't do that right now. But with Nina Turner, they're a step closer to doing that, right? Um, but uh, that's something that, you know, that's like I said, that's speaking to the choir. They got to get out there and get people who might not come out for Nina Turner or might not even come out to vote to come out and vote for Nina Turner. That's why they can't go for the to the Cleveland Medicare for All March. Uh Matt, what's the second reason? Uh, the second reason is there is no Cleveland Medicare for All march. There's no march in Cleveland. AOC and Nina Turner having this event in Cleveland does nothing to the Medicare for All march because there's no Medicare for All march in Nina Turner's district. This is how ridiculous this is. I, I just am like, my mind is blown at how dumb this is. I can't even just, uh, are you serious? <laughs> There's no march for Nina to attend. Are you saying she should leave her district 10 days before her campaign and go to some Medicare for all march that would do nothing to help her get elected so she can actually get into a position of power and help make Medicare for all one step closer to actually happening? I just... Ah! I'm, I don't even know. I, I This is... I... I, I... <laughs> my god and uh, just one more thing one more thing to to top this off here uh one more thing to top this off here uh i really uh really so uh fiorella is really mad that uh uh nina turner is not attending a non-existent uh medicare for all march shows she's not a real fighter for medicare for all fiorella of convo couch big supporter of Medicare for All, right? It's one of the reasons why she was forced to vote and all this leftist infighting has been happening over Medicare for All happening. That's because she's a hardcore advocate for Medicare for All, right? Uh, one problem, one problem. Uh, this was her just a few days ago. Uh, reply, oh, so someone says, at uh, this person, don't know who this is, inconsequential, not gonna, you know, but this is what this person says. Medicare for All centralizes healthcare and I'm against giving government more power. Of course, I'm against it. 
it being a Medicare for all. I'm so for a complete overhaul of our healthcare system, but I'm not just going to accept Bernie Sanders' Trojan horse like some reactionary sheep. Now, that's not Fiorella. Okay, so Fiorella jumps in. And I'm assuming she's going to fight this person uh, in the comments and advocate for Medicare for all. And Fiorella says, agreed. Agreed. Uh, agreed. I, I'm, I'm, I, I just, I, I can't. I can't even believe this. I am against for doing that also. My issue is people are dying or in debt without meds. In the system we're in, I'd rather folks have insulin than not, at least giving states and maybe cities more than the federal government. For me, mutual aid has to come from smaller coalitions. It's tough. So I want to make this completely clear what this means. Fiorella is coming out as a libertarian at the very least. I mean, it almost sounds like she's advocating for... Uh, it sounds like she's advocating for like some sort of uh, anarcho-capitalist uh, libertarianism or some shit like that. Um, whatever that... Uh, what is the, the yellow-black uh, one? The black and yellow uh, flag? But um, this is astounding. You can't be against government-run health care and be an advocate for Medicare for all. You can't... I'm like, I, 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 I don't know what to say. How do, you, how do you have a conversation with people like this? Well, you can. But how do you get through to people like this? So she doesn't want Medicare for all. And by the way, giving states and cities more for the uh, more uh, letting states and cities run this, you know what's going to happen, right? I mean, you know what's going to happen. You care about people dying in debt without meds in a system where the states and the uh, local cities uh, uh, decide this and run their own uh, Medicare medic medical uh, uh, healthcare systems. Which, by the way, hardcore uh, right wing ideology that uh, the states should have more power and everything should be run by local government. Who, by the way. Local government, way more corrupt than you can imagine. Like, I, federal government may be corrupt in certain ways, but at least there's pressure that can be pushed on them and things can be done to hold them to account. Local governments, this stuff usually doesn't get out. They get away with so much shit in local government. Um, so this is libertarian ideology at the very... Uh, I'm, getting, I'm, being, I'm being nice there. But uh, you know what would happen here if you care about people... Uh, people living in red states would die because, you know, Alabama, Missouri, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, Kentucky, Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, uh, Florida, South Carolina, uh, probably forgetting a few, their states will not provide them with a, a state-run healthcare system. They'll be forced to fend for themselves, and they will die. Because private insurance will be all they've got, and private insurance would probably end up trying to make up money lost from the blue states that are providing this, like New York and California, to their citizens. Uh, they will probably try to make up for that money by bilking up the healthcare costs for the red states or people who need to buy their own health care uh, on the private market because their governor or their uh, local right-wing Republican QAnon believer who just got elected to office won't give them government-run health care. Just, I, I don't, I, I, but AOC is the one who doesn't want Medicare for all for you and Nina Turner is a sellout for not attending an event that does not exist in her district. Oh, my God. I don't even... I don't even... How do you... What do you... What do you... I, uh, I, 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 it literally is just being anti-establishment for the sake of being anti-establishment. It's like... It's like thinking fucking punk rock is spiking your hair 
and wearing a studded vest. I, I've been, listen, I've been, I've been, I, I totally get that because that analogy rings true to me because I know many people who've came and went from that scene. It literally is the same thing. It's cool just to be in the aesthetics of it, right? But the second push comes to shove, uh, you don't really believe in any of that because that's not what it's about. You just like being anti-establishment. You just like that label, right? That's what this is all about. As soon as what you want wins, you'll be against that because then that becomes wrapped up into the establishment. I mean, that's really the ideology they have here. I mean, is the government, federal government perfect? Far from it. Is Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, various other social safety net, social safety net welfare programs some of the best examples of government? Absolutely. And Medicare for All would be one of those. And we would be able to hold that up as just like how the UK has the uh, NHS. We hold that up as a position of pride, a rare thing of pride, where, wow, our country actually ended up doing this and actually did something to help its people. And you're just against that because it would be government. It's just, it's just a completely reactionary, anti-establishment for the sake of aesthetics reasoning. Uh, is there any more Super Chats? Uh, Crusher, uh, sorry, Crew Her X with a Super Chat. AEW was rad last night. Very nice to be here live for once. So oh, great to have you here. Uh, Prairie, uh, oh, Kowalski with a super chat. I won't be here next week. Vegas bound. Ooh, have money. Thank you, Kowalski. I appreciate it. Um, enjoy Vegas. Um, if you win big, uh, come on the show and drop a super chat. <laughs> All right, everyone. That is the show for tonight. It's almost four hours. I did it again. All right. I will clip those uh, segments at the end for everybody to listen to on YouTube because I'm sure people won't go the whole way for the live stream. But um, for re-watching the live stream, I should say. Um, folks, have a great night. If you're, not, if you're watching and you're not a patron because you're watching live, please really do think of And you could afford to do so. I want to add that addendum. And you could afford to do the show, uh, to support the show. I would really appreciate your support growing this Patreon uh, uh, subscription because it really is helping grow the show. Nothing more I would like to do more shows. And to do that, I need to get a little bit of help. And to get that little bit of help, I would like to pay people. I do have one person who's volunteering to regularly cut these segments for me. And I, I can't thank them enough. Um, and then I do have a few people who've offered various like one-off volunteer things. And I can't thank them enough either. Um, if you'd like to help, if you can't afford to help the, the show and you want to help some way like that, um, I, again, I, I don't want people who, who, who like are out of work and, and like, if you're like, you know, comfortable, but just don't have the extra money and you want to support the show and like, you know, you're set with everything else and you just have some extra time and you want to help out. That's cool. If you like badly need a job and you're doing job searching, please, I, you should don't, don't waste your time on helping me out. <laughs> I just want to make that, you know, make the, what I'm looking for clear. Um, so have a great week, everybody. YouTube.com slash Matt Binder. Patreon.com slash Matt Binder. Twitter.com slash Matt Binder. Instagram.com slash Matt Binder. Twitch.tv slash Matt Binder. Oh, follow me all those places, too, to make sure. I probably will be doing another uh, 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 random live stream during the week, too, like I did this past week. If you haven't caught it, I just put it up as a patron-only audio bonus for patrons, and it's a uh, on the um, live stream uh, replays on YouTube from uh, Wednesday night. It's about Bezos and space, or quote-unquote space. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, see you when I do that uh, rando live stream. 
Or if not, then see you on the next episode of Doom next week. Uh, and with that, see you all next time on Doomed. <laughs>